Hello, Eleni. Hello, Eleni. Good afternoon, whatever it is. Good morning. I'm lost a bit Hello. With, the, with the time now. I had this night dream yesterday that it was on the wrong time um, zone and <laughs> was <laughs> after my presentation, but I made it. No, everything fine. Thank you. Great. I think we are now all coming back. So let's give another two, three minutes and we can start. I Rob, I get that in the background is not handy, is that is it? <laughs> Good girl. Yes. Indeed. I have lasers in, in my back. <laughs> I can see that, be careful, yes. yes they, uh, they can hurt. Oh, Let me mute right. myself before I say stupid things. Yes. Hi everyone, um, I think we can start. Um, I'm Eleni Louis, so I will uh, continue uh, taking the role of uh, Thoma Ida. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Cyprus University of Technology and the Eratosthenes Center of Excellence. Um, the next session is about atmospheric research with airborne and spaceborne sensors. And the chair for this session will be uh, Dr. Johannes Bull from uh, Tropos. Um, Johannes, are you here with us? Okay. Johannes is, is coming. I just got the message from him.
So, hello, I'm here. Hi, Johannes. So I'm giving you the floor. We can start with the next session. Okay. Oh, hello. Um, our next session about um, atmospheric research with urban and space bound sensors. We'll start with a talk of Rob Kochmann from the European Space Agency. And he will talk about the EarthCare uh, status and validation program. Rob, please go ahead. Thank you, Johannes. Thank you also to the organizers for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. And something is not happening. You don't see my screen, right? It's uh, not yet. No, it's a. Uh, uh, something. Looking. with an exclamation mark it says okay it's a system okay it's I found it okay now it should my computer should allow settings we have actually at ESA we have uh, normally we are not allowed to use zoom okay but I think I found a way around because my laptop is uh, is not uh, it's not fully easy managed so uh, do you see my screen now yes okay there we go to presentation mode yes so yes. I will address the here with, I'll try to speed up to lost the time, uh, to make up for the time lost, but indeed I will speak about the Earthcare mission and its validation program. And uh, you see the uh, instrument behind me, the, the mission behind me. Um, briefly, the mission is about uh, you know, the Earth, um, radiation, budget, and the interaction with clouds and aerosols, and uh, also to uh, improve the climate and, and numerical weather prediction models basically because there's a lot of fundamental information missing uh, it's it's not so much an operator that's a mission intended for operational use it's really research um so the um yeah the, the there's a synergistic use of all, all the instruments so you you see here here if you can see my mouse uh, there's the uh, the different lines of sight um, and um, um, and very important there is there's a two active instruments so therefore you see these vertical uh, curtains here in this, uh, in this image um, it is the sixth earth explorer mission so there's an ESA program that complements the the Copernicus and meteor meteorological programs so it is the um, and, and Thus far, it is the most complex and largest uh, mission of the Earth Explorer program. Uh, also, um, it is eagerly anticipated by the uh, agencies and also ECMWF. In, in particular, they express that the, uh, the potential for Earthcare to uh, to also have a, a large impact on the on the operations of ECMWF. It's uh, it's very likely. So, my successor in this conference uh, the next speaker will, will uh, certainly uh, uh, highlight that uh, that aeolus success it, uh, as well, uh, one of the most important uh, satellite missions to have impact on the 
modeling of the weather forecast. Um, so, as mentioned, synergistic mission. So there's uh, uh, four instruments. Um, there's you see five blocks, but these Doppler and the uh, uh, traditional radar. It's, it's of course one instrument. So there's this. Uh, um, um, the CPR, the cloud profile, they already provided by JAXA, the Japanese agency, and then there's ATLAS, so the LIDAR, the MSI, and spectral imager, and the broadband radiometer provided by ESA, and there's this, um, uh, yeah, this synergy to derive these geophysical products, so precipitation and ice and water information, so cloudiness uh, characteristics, there's um, aerosol characteristics from using both the MSI and the outlet, for example, and there's this radiation broadband um, that is also combined, and um, you know, there's an overall also closure using the the let's say the the scene constructed by the three instruments to the left, and then comparing it to the BBR observations. It is quite a beast. Um, it is um, uh, this is a. Uh, the, the the instrument what is the what is rather particular is the low orbit uh, so it's uh, only at 400 kilometers um, and that um, yeah that means it also has probably little chance to go and uh, its lifetime since we are in a, in a solar activity uh, peak uh, during its uh, its launch and it's uh, here you can see that the uh, uh, the image, which is the one I used uh, behind, it's on the left here, which is of course the artist's impression, but the uh, the real one ha is beginning to look uh, rather a lot like it. So it's actually uh, all instruments uh, in May, actually we received the last instrument, so all instruments are now mounted uh, on the satellite and we're really um, yeah, confident now that we can launch as expected in March. Uh, 2023 so we're now going for for the system tests so where all instruments are um, are mounted uh, so that there's a sub system test the instrument level have been done but now we're going for system level test top level tests um, the I will not go into too much detail maybe if there's a time but if there's a questions so the the outlet of course is the 355 nanometer which is uh, different from the calypso um, which is at uh, um, 532 so but this was um, chosen for um, yeah for, for really to to have um, uh, higher signal to noise and combined with a lower altitude um, it's really uh, it's supposed to bring advantages uh, also the the polarization uh, that, that's, it's again a, an improvement with respect to Calypso that we have measured the co and cross polarization so that is uh, yeah it's promising for a, for a very uh, significant contribution to, to science the MSI is also um, yeah it's it's uh, an imagery with with channels which are um, some parts are overlapping with earlier missions um, also with um, yeah, with presently orbiting missions but they're also different uh, different channels you can see them here and then there's the um, yeah the BBR which again you, you see the, the properties here it has a, a long wave uh, and a short wave a channel um, so actually the the short wave channels are overlapping uh, so um, Okay, then there's the Japanese instrument, uh, the cloud profiling rider, which is uh, at operating at 94 gigahertz. And uh, no, some nice film, but I think I have to cut that to uh, cut that short. But uh, as mentioned, this is the uh, this is the um, status fresh uh, all instruments integrated. And I hope it goes on to the next slide now. Uh, I don't have to go through the film. I'll, I'll speed it up then to be able to get out of this slide. Oh no, it starts again. I have to hit escape briefly to get to the next slide. Okay. 
this now it's black. <laughs> I didn't expect this. this, this we usually use WebEx and it's as you go, yes, now the next slide. Okay, so actually I already addressed, addressed a little bit this Synergy. Um, it is a very complex model. This is a very simplified uh, scene. There's actually uh, 44 products. Uh, so it's, it's really, um, uh, and also the interaction with the ground segments at ESA and JAXA, it's, it's very, very complex. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth because both ESA and JAXA make their own products, but they have some dependencies in the chain. And that is again also affecting the validation, which is my next topic. So each, each agency is res responsible for the validation of its own products. Uh, ESA has uh, the outlet, and the BBR and MSI level one, plus many level two single and multi-sensor products, including sensor uh, level two products for the JAXA instrument. And JAXA has its own level one products, but also level two single um, instrument products for the ESA instruments and the multi-sensor products, which are which are always uh, complex. Um, the yeah, each agency has organized its validation uh, generally by announcements of opportunity, and um, JAXA is actually organizing another one right now. And now I, I concentrate on the ESA one, so we have this in. Uh, 2017 and uh, there were um, uh, 35 uh, principal investigators um, including from the eastern Mediterranean and uh, there's also uh, these uh, having a look at, at a subset of the instruments that are they are proposed to be used for validation this this is a map of the lidars and the radars so there's many more instruments and here I focus on the ground-based um, systems, but um, you see that uh, you know, the, the areas well covered, including uh, yeah, the region of interest of this workshop. Uh, then we had several workshops. We had one focusing on the scope of the program, where basically we are reviewed and uh, with um, the broader science community and. and in, Indeed, it was uh, considered that uh, um, the program was adequate, but it's, it really needs full funding to uh, avoid gaps. And um, there was some gaps in the tropics, and uh, also the cloud profiling radars could uh, benefit from additional instruments for, for context uh, with weather, weather radars, for example. Uh, and the coverage was uh, not, uh, so not as optimal as of the, of the lidars. And, um, the second foot workshop is just uh, a week, uh, two weeks ago. I was still processing it. Actually, uh, this high, this uh, slide is really not a very. Uh, um, uh, it was a first attempt to, to capture the uh, the highlights, but uh, there's um, um, yeah, there's for example for the lidars to to have level one validation, you really need additional um, step to go via the scenes and to to. Uh, to really take into account the fundal dif fundamental differences of backscattering upwards and downwards. Um, so um, there's also the classification, validation of, of aerosol type classification. It is um, specific to earth care because it, the general one is, is not optimized um, for this, um, you know, this polarization channels and, and the, the properties of the earth care instrument. So there's a, earth care has its own uh, aerosol classification scheme and um, that, that needs to be taken into account when, when validating aerosol classification. There were also several campaigns, historic and future, uh, identified for uh, validation exercises. The network session uh, recommended that there's intercomparison between the different networks because within the networks is really already uh, very well done. Uh, and um, the harmonization of approaches to, to, to analysis of, of earth care and network data that was a topic of interest. The, the, uh, the use of additional observations that are not directly measuring what earth care is measuring, but to, to, to assess the homogeneity and representativity was, was commented. Um, clouds and precipitation it was highlighted that blind zones, uh, there were instruments, both the LIDAR and the uh, the other cloud program radar will not uh, be able to, to see that will affect some retrievals even. There's uncertainties in snow and ice, microphysics, so there is, there's really a need for in situ 
measurements uh, and the importance but also the difficulty of validation over the ocean was highlighted there. The campaign session highlighted the collaboration with the ACCP in the US but also other initiatives and the highlights of the need to combine in situ and remote sensing. Also again the shipborne validation and it highlighted there was a joint campaign for Earthcare and Aeolus and I'm sure that Tommaso will, will go into more detail there and well, also next slide about that and the possibility of a campaign in the eastern Mediterranean was highlighted and I'll, I'll show them the slide after next which is probably many people in, who were involved in generating it. Uh, and funding is still an open issue for many teams where we are interacting with uh, the national funding agencies there trying to, uh, yeah, to, do, uh, to, to make it uh, a success. Uh, so this was the, um, the Cape Verde campaign um, and um, there's, uh, it's, it's delayed now to September so it was planned for last year but of course because of the pandemic it has to be delayed and uh, it's, it's, we had a meeting yesterday where it was basically all systems go and of course there's um, uh, yeah, also people um, involved uh, from again the, the region and this uh, uh, collaborating and uh, present workshop so um, both also in the um, uh, airborne and ground uh, site so uh, the drawing is not fully up to date nasa is flying from puerto rico because of their travel restrictions so they're not flying from sal uh, this is again this was discussed at the um, at the campaign session the workshop so i just copied that slide and of course the uh, you'd see uh, um, yourself back in, in here so that um, that was very well um, well received and uh, uh, so that, that was it. I hope I've recovered some time or at least not gone too far out of it. These, all these um, presentations of the first and soon the second validation workshop will be available online. Uh, the scientific validation plan is online and all of this is uh, available at HTTP and etc. You can see the link uh, below. Uh, I'll put it in the, in the chat. So this was my talk and uh, acknowledging this uh, yeah, following project. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Rob. Um, that was a really uh, interesting, um, uh, let's say, sneak peek into the future. And we will, uh, of course, be happy um, to contribute to this Calva campaign. I think the instruments of the um, GBS that uh, uh, were presented before, the ground based station at Lima, so will just be ready. Uh, when Earthcare is launched, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I think um, uh, we go on. Um, this Earthcare is a um, is a future satellite or near future satellite, but we already have one, uh, let's say, sister mission uh, flying, which is um, the. The Olus satellite, and which will be the topic for the next uh, talk by Tommaso Parinello. Hello. So I hope you can see the right uh, slide. This is the most complicated thing to be done. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you. Yes. Thank you to thank you, Chairman. Thank you uh, to to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tommaso Parinello. I am uh, the mission the ALUS uh, mission manager, and it's a pleasure for me to talk today about ALUS in this workshop and give you uh, the general overview and the current status of the mission and what we want to do in the next two years. Um, this overall presentation on ALUS will then be complemented after by the second presentation, which will be given by Oliver Reiter book, but he will be more focusing on the performance of the ALUS missions uh, and, uh, uh, and the quality of the data uh, for global observations and also profiles. Let me start by acknowledging my co-authors, which you don't see in this slide here, but I will I put their names at the end in the acknowledgement slide. This is only a very small part of the whole, I'll say, uh, mission team, which is supporting us um, uh, in the last, I'll say, three years. 
Um, I wasn't sure you were familiar with ALO's mission, so I want just to give you very quickly through some introduction slides about the mission. I think uh, Rob already gave uh, a, a sign of it, but uh, let me try to get a bit more details, but very quickly. The ALO's mission is part of the ESA Earth Observation Program that is made of three main activities, which you see on the slide. The science stream, which is one on the left, which addresses mainly scientific questions about how our planet function works and include, includes also a technological demonstrator. The middle part, which is the Copernicus stream, and this is done in collaboration with the European Commission, which is more looking at our planets and its environment for the benefits of the European citizens. Data are often used uh, in a wide collection of applications and services which span from atmosphere, marine, land, climate, security, and emergency. The third stream, which is the one you see on the right, is in collaboration with UNESTAT for meteorological services. We build the satellites and UNESTAT operate them. As you can understand, ALOS belongs to the left part, the design part of this program. Now, ALOS was launched, uh, so it's part of the Earth Explorer or Science program, which was launched almost three years ago from Kourou on a Vega uh, launcher. The main payload, and we'll have a slide on this, is a laser, which is operating, as you can see, at the same frequency of the, the Atli.EarthCare. The orbit is around 320 kilometers, shows lower than EarthCare, with an inclination of 97. It's on synchronous, dawn dusk, seven days repeat. The mission control is done in Germany. The ground stations where we acquire the data is, uh, is from the north to the south of our planets, from Kiruna and Troy Antarctic as well. The processing of the data when it comes down is done mainly at Tromso and in the, at ECMWF here in Reading. Algorithms, processes, and data qualities is done by the DISC consortiums and Oliver Reiter book, which comes after me, will give you a bit more information about that. Mission management is where we manage all the mission is done in Italy, in Airstream. And the lifetime, the design lifetime of the satellite was three years, and uh, technically speaking, it should have ended at the end of 2021. I'll tell you that probably we're going to do for another year. So, um, the two main objectives of the missions are to improve the quality of weather forecast by providing global measurements of horizontal wind profiles in the troposphere and lower stratosphere, and also to advance our understanding of the atmospheric dynamics and climate processes. It has also, a, I would say, a handful of, uh, of goals as well, in addition to the objectives. And just I wanted to put one here, which is probably relevant for you, at, at least for Earth as well, is that uh, a long-term one is to demonstrate space-based uh, Doppler wind light the capability for operational use. Now, the motivation for building these missions was primarily based on the fact that the wind observations are scarce in the current global observation systems. And this, as you know, limits our ability to predict weather, especially in the tropics, where the atmospheric motions of all scales, as you know, are dominated by wind fields. And also there was expectation to obtain information on aerosol and cloud properties. And as you know, Earth, which comes after us, will basically have more on this. But I've oft, uh, I'll say after, after three years, we believe that we have contributed today to reduce this gap. A quick slide on the measurement principle. ALOS measures winds on a side looking way over um, and up to 35 degrees from nadir, and it's capturing profiles over the line of sights, uh, and then it's projected on the horizontal line of sights. The main instrument, as we said, is a Doppler wind LiDAR, which operated at 355 nanometers. Uh, we receive back the echo coming from molecular and aerosol and cloud backscattering into two channels, Rayleigh and me. We regularly perform calibration to keep under control the drift, the random errors, the biases, and overall to keep the quality and performance of, of the data so that is high. The winds are then referred to, to a vertical curtain grid, which is spread over 24 vertical beams, which can be programmed. And the resolution is between 250 meters and two kilometers, while the horizontal resolution is 87 for Rayleigh and, and, and lower, better, 10 kilometers for me. A quick slide to remark the onboard instrument is an incredible technological piece of kit. I will say I'm probably one of the most sophisticated instruments ever, ever to be put in orbit. And it has, has manifested all these peculiarities, I will say, in the last three years in space. The instrument compromises a higher power ultraviolet laser transmitter and goes through more than 80 optical functions and different wavelength conversion. The signal is then received back through 1.5 meter telescope, which is 
turn it through a very small 80 microns field of stop and through many, believe me, through many other uh, elements uh, of this, uh, which makes the instrument. And based on the Doppler LiDAR principle, we are able to detect difference in the frequency of the order of 5.64 megahertz. And if you want, this is a difference of a wavelength of around two femto. Now on the status, so let's now go into the core of the status of the mission. Overall, the performance of the mission is quite good. This is a very busy slide, I apologize. Um, it's good despite, I will say, the challenges which we have been facing since its launch. I will say now actually that it's very good despite those problems. The platform is performing well and any sign is within the specification. In July, two years ago now, we switched to the redundant laser called FMB. And since then, the output of laser has been stable with its output energy. And, um, and very little sign of degradation if compared to the previous laser. And you can see all this, which I'm saying in the graph on, on the right. In March this year, unfortunately, the laser went to, into survival mode. Basically, it switched itself off. And, and this was caused in response to a spurious set of instructions while performing a calibration. The event itself did not cause any hardware damage to the instrument and allow us to resume operations at the beginning of May, so just a month ago. But the most critical problem remains the decrease of the return energy that we receive, that we are measuring, and also problems with the internal signal. And now these are starting to have an effect on the quality of the data and especially on the random errors. Now, in order to tackle these problems, we are following a dedicated roadmap with the objective to try to recapture the mission energy and reverse the trend. This roadmap foresees also a return eventually to the prime laser, the one we switched in two years ago, and even, and also, if possible, to lower the orbit by 53 kilometers. And all this is really becoming already challenging for us for what we're going to do, and nevertheless, it's still under investigation. The final point is just to say that from the ground, second point of view, no issue here to report, and the mission planning is following not only the background mission, but also accommodating new requests which come in from uh, new investigations from the user community and also to support basically um, the investigation we're doing. And the good news is that despite all this, we have now funds to run the mission beyond its, uh, pri its first three years, and we have money to run the mission until the end of 22. Now, the quality of our data, and um, I see that probably Oliver will go a bit more deep than that, is currently monitored by the DISC consortium, which Oliver is the leader, which is also supporting the investigation of the instruments. And we are aware that so while we have been successful in keeping under control the biases, it will be very challenging, we know that, to reduce the random errors to the values requested by the mission requirements, which you see in this table here. It is not only this is not only due to the fact that the current that we have these current issues, but also that we are missing a factor of two to three of energy backscattered coming into the instrument since the beginning. However, our main goal is to maintain values of the random errors so that the impact on the numerical weather prediction is still visible and measurable. Until then, the expected mission lifetime, both the evolution plan of the products, which is taking consideration the ongoing investigations, the new studies, the synergies with other missions is now consolidated. And I have a slide at the end which gives you an overall timeline. Not moving on, uh, on the science part, on the science, let me outline that ALUS now have, uh, data are now assimilated by four most important meta sense in Europe, and also recently by the Indian National Center for Medium Range Forecast, weather forecasting. Or the sensors will likely join by the end of this year. So let me say that we have achieved mission objectives. In fact, the beneficial impact of the ALS wind in most of the global NWP models has now been proven while the contribution to the atmospheric dynamics, if you want the object, the second objective of our missions has started now to emerge in literature. For this, I'd like to take the opportunity that, that, to, to remind, if you are interested, that we have a deadline for special ALUS issue, which will be done, which is now has been extended, sorry, until September 2021. So overall, the scientific in, and the innovation studies are on track according to a science plan, which was um, designed, uh, proposed at the beginning of the mission, and a full report of the status of the mission objectives will be prepared at the end of next year. This is because we have been extended. And I take here the opportunity, I, I don't need to go to more details because I see that Rob has already given you something, some information about it. Our trouble campaign due to coronavirus has been postponed by a year. 
Now it was planned in July, but we decided to postpone it to September this year. It seems that we are going for it, but the the the, go, the final go no go it's will come in the in the next in the next uh, couple of uh, weeks, probably days, really. Now, since last year, taking in consideration the mission situation and the continuous, I'll say, dialogue with the user community has led us to define four strategic mission goals, which will drive the operation until the end of next year and hopefully beyond. The first goal concerns the accomplish accomplishments of the trouble campaign. So that is why it's important to us, but that needs to be accomplished with the best possible laser performance in order to accomplish both the validation and scientific aspect of the campaign. While the next two goals, I don't want to go into details here, you can, you can read them. The next two goals focus more on the ability to provide the best mission performance, either during the design, light and until the extended phase. The last goal is quite new, I would say, focus more on the fact that if we may have a, an opportunity, and I will, I will say a unique opportunity, to do, to do new science and um, uh, new technology, see CLS like a technology laboratory and demonstrate that in space. And that would be a, quite a great value for the next Doppler wind laser mission, including follow on. And we are open to collect ideas on things which we can perform at the end of the operation mission. This is, of course, something which is to be confirmed because we have to get there first. And as mentioned before, uh, these goals will drive the operation roadmap, which you see here for the next two years. It is a complex plan, but as you can see, it still have a number of options to exercise before we arrive at the bottom of this really long and winding road. Every step you see here is an activity that we want to perform from now until the end of the mission in order to recapture the energy and try to maintain the performance as good as we can. And I'm going now to conclusion, almost to the conclusion of my presentation. But before going to the final slide, let me give you an overview and visibility of what the timeline would be in front of us. What you see up there is basically the nominal chronological sequence of milestones, which will consider, for, which consider, for example, the delivery of the next product baselines, the reprocessings, and other important part. Consider instead the activities linked to the execution of this roadmap, which I just mentioned before, and uh, which I just mentioned before. As you can see, anything which is going to happen in the lower part will have, I will say, a significant impact on uh, on the upper part. And I will say, we are also in doing all that these activities. We have to keep in mind that now we have, in addition to the mission objectives, we also have four mission goals which we would like to come um, to accomplish. As you can see, we are right here on the left side, but in front of us, I don't say we have a new mission, but we have a very complicated still mission to accomplish. And this goes me to my, goes to my last slide, very quick browsing through what I just said before. It, performance of the mission is good, and we have been providing wind measurements for more than two and a half years now, having solved most of the main biases and having kept under control the random errors. In addition, the problem uh, to the problem which occurred two months ago, a number of critical issues remain still challenging with the instruments, which will drive the timeline of operations for the following 18 months. For this, I just showed you before that we have a dedicated complex roadmap which we have which we have to implement. We have seen that the beneficial impact of ALOS wind, despite the problems we have had in most of the global NWP models, have been now been proven while the contribution to the atmospheric dynamics uh, have now started to emerge in literature. And we will know more about this in, in the future. Uncertainties related to the coronavirus has forced us to, um, to, to, um, to, uh, to have a new plan for the trouble campaign, which is now likely to take place in September. And finally, the overall achievement of ALUS as a scientific and technological demonstrator is good. And we are convinced that it is becoming a now a worldwide acknowledged pathfinder of any future Doppler wind light emissions. And my last comment here is that we are now planning to have our third anniversary ALUS Calval and Science Workshop next year, end of March 2022. And with this, I just go to Masla, which is not only acknowledging, of course, the project, but here are the names of the people. Of which are contributing uh, to, I will say, to the success of this meeting, of this, sorry, of this mission. And as I said before, this is just a small part of the overall mission. So thank you.
Thank you, Tommaso, for this uh, really um, interesting talk about the Olus mission. We are all very excited and wish you good luck that this will uh, go on further. And uh, we uh, go to Oliver Reitebuch. And Oliver was on Cyprus uh, with the Falcon aircraft during um, the A Life campaign, which took place uh, para in parallel to the Psycare campaign. And I'm uh, very excited to hear from him uh, what special meaning the Eastern Mediterranean has for Eolus and the other way around. Uh, so thank you very much for this kind introduction. I want to highlight uh, the performance of the Aeolus mission and give you some insights in this exciting last three years, which we had with Aeolus. You see here on my slide uh, with the 1.5 meter telescope. Uh, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues from the Aeolus Data Innovation and Science Cluster disk and my ESA colleagues. Uh, and this uh, AELOS disk is coordinated by DLR. We are currently about uh, 40 scientists from 14 institutes, including NWP centers like ECMWF, uh, Meteor Force, and KNMI. And some of us are already working on AELOS for the last 20 years. And uh, I will show you a few uh, highlights from the AELOS mission and its performance. And uh, I have specifically prepared some slides for this workshop about Aeolus aerosol products and its validation in this Eastern Mediterranean uh, with the support by Holger Bass from Tropos for providing some slides for this topic. Uh, the Aeolus wind lighter is the, actually the first European lighter in space and, space and it's the first wind lighter worldwide in space. As you hear, it's in a remarkable low orbit of only uh, 320 kilometer uh, due, to the, due to the LiDAR on board. It measure, measures uh, wind profiles al al along a curtain in the atmosphere. We have about 6,200 wind profiles uh, uh, per day, which is five to six times more than, than we have from radio zones today, from ground to about a 25 to 30 kilometer with a resolution of, of 90 kilometer for the Rayleigh channel and as you have heard 10 kilometer for the for the meat channels. The, the wind re uh, requirements are quite challenging. I will say a few words about the actual performance in this, but we not only measure wind, but we also have a so-called aerosol product, uh, which uh, which is actually derived from an HSRL retrieval, a backscatter coefficient, extinction coefficient and LIDAR ratio. And so the, I want to highlight uh, some some uh, uh, some uh, ha some topics which happened during the last three years uh, since the launch. We actually already had uh, three weeks after after launch. We had our first wind profiles, and we could release the data to the Calvai teams already uh, within four months after launch and successfully perform an in, in orbit commissioning review by the end of January. We had to solve some issues with the systematic errors uh, uh, in, the, in the first year. So the first one was related to some detector issues where we had so-called hot pixels. This was successfully solved in by, by mid of 2019. Then we switched to the second laser. And with this uh, solving of the biases, it was uh, possible that ECMWF started already uh, in January 2020 uh, with the operational assimilation of Aeolus products. We had then another very important bias correction uh, developed by the disk uh, using the temperatures from the M1 mirror. And this also allowed us then to publicly release the wind products uh, to everybody uh, in May 2020. Then also driven by the COVID situation where we had a big loss of uh, wind observations uh, by several weather centers due to the missing aircrafts. Uh, DW, German weather service Meteor Force started then um, in uh, by mid of uh, last year with operational assimilation of Aeolus data and UK Met Office followed by the end of last year. Already and with this success already ESA and UMETSAT started preparation for Aeolus follow-on missions in the time frame 2030 to 40. And we will soon uh, be able to publicly release also the aerosol pro product. And I'm looking forward to the Aeolus Tropical campaign. 
And I want to show you on this slide the, the main characteristics of our, of our wind product. Uh, here you see the wind uh, line of sight measurements along one orbit. And as it's a line of sight measurement, it has a negative and, and positive signs. So the negative winds, they are blowing basically that the blue colors, they are blowing towards the instrument and the positive ones are blowing away from the instrument. So it's not the full uh, horizontal wind vector, but you already see here with the uh, with these uh, colors that we quite remarkably sense, sense the, the tropical jets, so the polar jets here, but also see the indication of the polar vortex uh, around Antarctica uh, in, in this part of the orbit. And this was a very early observation from my EOLUS uh, a few weeks after launch from September 2018. And this already compared quite well with, uh, and I'm sli slipping back and forth with wind scenes by the ECMWF model. And this gave us very good confidence that, that, that we have uh, achieved a very good uh, mission and, and data product. If you want, to, I want to encourage you to have a look on the ALOS products. The data are publicly available. You can get a first glimpse of these uh, products by using an, a very cool tool called Virus. It's an interactive web browser tool where you can uh, visualize the, the ALOS data. Uh, here, for example, Rayleigh channel data here, the meet channel data from cloud tops uh, uh, interactively in a web browser un under this uh, address. And we are currently working on a Python interface to this web browser uh, to actually support further the Calvi teams working on it. On DLR side, we already started a few months after launch with a first validation campaign. So we put two wind gliders on board the DLR Falcon aircraft and flow around in, in Central Europe. But with, already within the first year of operation of Aeolus, we performed three airborne campaigns with uh, performing underflights. You see this on the straight flight paths, uh, both in Central Europe and then also in the, in the North Atlantic and, and Greenland uh, based on Iceland. And you see here an, a one example of a, of a nice curtain of our EOLUS measurements of the horizontal line of side wind speeds on top compared to uh, our reference instrument on board the DLR Falcon uh, operating at uh, two micron, which you see here. So it's, a, it's qu uh, qualitatively a good agreement. You see also that the airborne wind gliders allow much, much higher vertical and, and horizontal resolution. And you see this single profile comparison. Uh, also over here. And we are now uh, preparing the, tr the tropical campaign, which was mentioned already. Uh, the monitoring of the data is which is a, a great benefit. And you see here the monitoring statistics for the uh, Rayleigh spectrometer winds on the left and for the Mi cloudy winds, which are coming from cloud tops of strong aerosol, later, aerosol layers on the right. Uh, in blue, uh, and for the complete mission, in blue here is the, the systematic errors. We had at the beginning, we had large systematic errors of um, several meters per second. But since we have applied all bias correction schemes, so the systematic error, and this is very important for operational assimilation, is really around zero. What is of concern is certainly the, the evolution of the random errors. We started with around four to five meter per second. We are currently at, at six meter per second for the Rayleigh channel and around four, four and a half meter per second uh, for the Mi cloudy uh, winds. Despite these high random errors, uh, uh, EOLOS uh, provides already a positive impact for several NWP centers. Uh, and uh, this is shown on this graph over here, where you show where you see the EOLUS uh, perf uh, metric, uh, a typical metric used the forecast sensitivity observation impact, and and uh, EOLUS is among the top three satellite instrument, and this is a rem remarkable achievement for such a explorer mission. And now to some uh, uh, aerosol validation uh, products uh, in and examples in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, uh, I want to first show you uh, on, on one orbit uh, that we have also a measurement of backscatter coefficient uh, with different algorithms in the, in, the, uh, in the level 2A product. Here, our standard product uh, for the along one orbit. And then we have worked on the algorithms in the past uh, months also to include 
uh, a very similar algorithm used on the Earth Commission on on the for the Atlet instrument. You see it's on uh, on, the, on this panel over here, which improves our data quality and the noise characteristics of our data. Uh, products significantly. You see here in, in higher yellow color cloud, cloud top values and also strong aer aerosol layers. And certainly it's important as we don't have any, any similar uh, operational monitoring for the level 2A uh, pro products uh, as for the wind products to, to make ground-based validation. And I've chosen here one example of uh, ground-based validation of the EOLOS products. Uh, which was performed uh, with uh, a ground-based lighter at uh, at Leipzig for a uh, for a case where the Californian wildfire smoke plumes uh, traveled uh, uh, across the, the the North Atlantic un until Leipzig, and you see here, and this was nicely uh, written up in a in a in a GRL paper by Holger Bass, uh, and if you see here uh, on on the figures, you see here the. A backscatter coefficient, the, the left one, the extinction coefficient, and the LIDAR ratio for the ground-based poly, poly XT LIDAR at 355 in, in black, and in, in, in red and in blue, the, the retrievals from Aeolus, uh, which fit quite good for this case, uh, for both the backscatter coefficient and the independent retrieval of the extinction coefficients. And from that, you can calculate the LIDAR ratio. And for such type of uh, investigations, you actually need uh, routine observations over over longer period due to, to only few uh, co-locations. And we are supported by very active aerosol validation teams in Germany, in Greece, from NOAA, in Spain, and that, and certainly the actress in early net and the Lali net uh, networks. And we have to already, I've already heard today in several talks, uh, that the Eastern Mediterranean is, is certainly a, a hotspot for, for aerosol remote sensing and an excellent place for validating a space mission. Um, and uh, due, also due to the excellent uh, ground instruments in these regions and due to the complex scenery with respect to the aerosol products. And that was the reason actually that uh, you see here a map and in, in magenta, you see the, the, the usual EOLOS uh, satellite tracks. And we have uh, specifically programmed the EOLOS satellite such that we have uh, better measurements uh, in this red box here around Cyprus uh, with a higher vertical resolution in the, in the interesting tropospheric layer for EOLOS, we call this Mars box. Uh, compared to the to the nominal layers, and I want to show you one example here with, for a validation with the ground-based lidar in Tel Aviv, which was introduced today in in the talk by Alexandra, uh, for both the backscatter coefficient and the extinction coefficient, and uh, you see here again the poly XT measurements. So basically, look on on the on the black curve here for 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 these. Um, a high backscatter, backscatter coefficients in the boundary layer, and the and the red and the and the blue or green retrievals from Aeolus. We are using also these comparisons to test our different algorithms. That's why we show here different different colors also. And you see here in, in terms of our qualitative agreement is quite good. We have a higher values here in the in the PBL at Tel Aviv. Um, at, in Aeolus compared to Tel Aviv, the black one, uh, but the uh, spatial variability, the spatial distance is, is more than 50 kilometer for that. We have also quite a good correspondence uh, for the extinction coefficient. So uh, Aeolus allows basically for, let's say, uh, cloud-free scenes and the cloud contamination is still an issue. Uh, that we have also to solve uh, the, a reliable extinction backcast profile measurement. We can retrieve with that the lighter ratio of aerosol typing, but the limitation clearly from IELOS is the missing, missing depolarization measurement for aerosol typing. Uh, uh, I had the pleasure to visit the wonderful island of Cyprus for the A Life campaign on board the DLR Falcon. We, ha we heard already today several times uh, from this campaign and this the highlights will be you will hear more about it in the talk by Bernadette Weinziel uh, in this session um, we were flying the DLR Falcon aircraft with in situ sensors and a wind lighter on board uh, uh, around Cyprus 
And I have brought uh, with me one example of one flight which we performed south of Cyprus here from a, from a case in on April 27 for the backscatter signal on top and for the wind speed and the wind direction. We measure here it, it with a scanning lighter so we can retrieve the full wind vector. And you see that we had two Sorry distance. for interrupting you, just please if you could try to speed up a bit because we are already some minutes late, thank you. Yeah, no problem, second most slide from, from the end. Uh, so we, you see several aerosol layers uh, embedded within a zone of very low wind speed, but what I have not seen before was the remarkable uh, heterogeneity basically in the wind direction. You see in these colorful uh, scales that we almost had every wind direction and it's a very complex and a very complex flow, flow south of this island. So with that I'm looking forward to the Aeolus tropical campaign which is now taking place in September hopefully with several aircrafts. We are basically also shifting the orbit of our Aeolus to match better the ground-based measurements on the island of Mindelo. And with that, I'm coming to my summary slide. Uh, we have seen that we have our first, uh, first European lighter, the first wind lighter in space in operation for almost now three years. And the mission objective, it's, and also this ESA Explorer program has a technology demonstration aspect, uh, is, uh, was achieved. We have seen that, uh, that we can operate lasers in the ultraviolet spectral region and LIDARs measuring winds uh, from space. Also the mission objective to demonstrate positive impact for numerical weather prediction was achieved. ECMWF, DWD, Meteor Frost and UK Met Office are using Aeolus wind products in operation and show positive impact. Aeolus Besides wind, Aeolus provides also aerosol optical profiles from a high spectral resolution LIDAR. Ground-based LIDARs and instrumentation in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Cyprus, in Greece, and Israel are key, are key elements for me for the validation of the Aeolus aerosol products. And Aeolus paves the way for the aerosol LIDAR on Earth care and a potential operational follow-on uh, wind LIDAR mission. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Oliver. Um, that was a really exciting talk, and uh, I'm, I'm really um, pleased to see that there is already for the a connection between the very young Eratosthenes uh, Center of Excellence and its PolyX team with the space mission. And I think we will hear um, a lot from each other in future. Yes, I <laughs> um, hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> so the exciting Eastern Mediterranean will not uh, will um, provide us with enough challenges. And um, yeah, now um, uh, the next talk um, is from Erich van Stocker from Goddard Space Flight Center from NASA. He will talk about the uh, GPM mission, the Global Precipitation Mission, which is in this collection of satellites that we uh, just saw, the Earth Care, the Eurus, and the GPM it's, is the, the precipitation uh, mission. And with these three satellites we have already covered a vast field from uh, radiative transfer measurements, microphysical measurements, wind measurements, and now uh, we go further to the precipitation measurements. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, um, let me say that we're um, currently in the uh, seventh year of a three-year mission. Predictions call for um, it, if the uh, satellite and instruments remain healthy, then uh, GPM can last till 2035, which isn't too bad for a three-year mission. Um, let me, somehow I ended up on, okay. Sorry about that. So I'd like to talk to you about the reprocessing. We're, we're currently scheduled to start another reprocessing cycle for uh, GPM. And to start that out, I'll give you a background of our, our current data product versions. At launch and the early checkout period, we had a version uh, V03 
It used vendor and pre-launch information for ancillary data. It was available for all, but it was generally focused on the algorithm developers. And it was especially important for calibrating the radar and the radiometer. Then um, about 180 days into the mission, we had the V04, which was the first official release to the public. This was still based on pre-launch validation data, but included all the on-orbit calibration analysis. It processed data from the beginning of the GPM mission in March of 2014, and the iMERGE data, which is the merged radiometer IR data, uh, only went to from March 2014, and it used cloud vector information for morphing. Then um, the current version is, and there are actually two versions, V05, V06. It was originally to be only V05, but after the release of the radar level two and three data, it was determined that there were some anonym uh, anomalous uh, precipitation and we recalled the uh, V05 radar products and we with a V06 algorithm. The radiometer stayed at uh, V05, but the radar went to V06. However, everything was reprocessed back to the beginning of trim. So V05, V06 is the first time that GPM algorithms were used all the way back to 1997. And indeed, for the level 1C radiometer products, we went back to 1987, which was the beginning of the SSMI era. Um, so iMERGE data switched to uh, using reanalysis and model data for its morphing, and therefore it could also go back to 2000. So now the iMERGE data, which is 0.1 degree by 0.1 degree half hourly products, is available consistently with a consistent algorithm back to the year 2000. In May of 2018, the scanning pattern for the KU radar was changed so that it could scan the entire KU swath rather than just the interior portion. So all the March 2014 to April 2018 data will always have a KA. Um, the match segment, which is the pixel matchup between KUKA, which is in the interior part of the KU spot, um, and a high sensitivity data where KA uh, observed in a, in a high, high sensitivity mode while the KU was scanning the outer edges of its swath. However, that was changed in May 2018. So from May 2018 to the end of the mission, KA high sensitivity swath, it will still be in a product, but it'll always be missing values. Whereas a KA normal swath will now match the KU swath across the entire 245 kilometer swath. For those interested in seeing what that would look like, there's already an existing uh, experimental product that's V06X that's produced where KA is a full 245 kilometer swath and it provides a full retrieval, dual precipitation uh, radar retrieval across the entire um, swath. This is available for public retrieval and the algorithm is based on the version six retrievals. So there have been some additional changes since the start, besides the radar, the start of uh, V05, V06. We um, use, uh, era interim uh, for the climatological version of the GPROF retrieval from the radiometer. So for both version four and version five, um, all the products that start with the designator 2A hyphen climb uh, use era interim. However, in September of 2019, ECMWF stopped the production of era interim and made era five available. So from October onward, of 2019, uh, the climatological versions of GPROP, which go all the way back to 1997, uh, are based on the era fives. Uh, no reprocessing was done. So what you'll see is prior September 2019 and previous, they have the version 05A, whereas those afterwards have 05B. And when we change the letter rather than the number, it generally means that there was a change in input data or a slight change in the algorithm 
um, but no reprocessing back to the beginning of the mission was done. We did some studies. There are small uh, regional and local differences, but globally, there's no statistically significant difference between the um, GPROP retrievals based on uh, error interim versus those based on era five. So what's the current uh, V07 reprocessing status? Um, current plans call for reprocessing to begin in autumn of two, 2021. At the request of people, um, all the products will be given the data product version V07. So uh, for the radiometer, um, the actually V06, uh, there's an error in the slide, will be skipped for public release. All products, radar and radiometer, want, will once again use the same data product version. As always, since version 5.6, all the data back to the trim era will be reprocessed with the version 7 GPM algorithms. Time permitting radiometer retrievals will also be extended back to 1987, uh, which begins the SSMI era. So a lot of this is dependent on the evaluation of the algorithms that are used. And there's also some question about the intercalibration of radiometers previous to the trim era. Um, generally, F13 is used for that, but it, it has some issues especially if you want consistency with those calibrated using GPMs, GMI, or TRIMS, TMI. So what are the impending changes for version 7? This is really important because if you're using GPM products, there's going to be some substantial difference for you to get used to in the version 7 products. Level 2 and level 3 radar products will be based on dual frequency retrieval techniques across the entire 245 kilometer swath. As a result of the, the swath increase, um, there are substantial format changes in both the level two and level three. Those format changes obviously include a KU that's now 245 kilometers across, but also the change in the name of the variables within the file itself. Uh, so if you're using radar data or combined data, you should go to this uh, location and get the uh, initial V07 file specification. Also, our current analysis shows that while V07 takes care of a lot of issues, including um, side, some side lobe issues, it shows a drop of retrievals over the ocean, uh, an increase over land. Uh, we're not exactly sure whether that uh, drop over the ocean has something to do with the sensitivity of the dual frequency retrievals or an algorithm artifact. And that's what they're looking at now. So again, if you use the radar, get the new format. Now, in the level two GPROF and level three uh, GPROF, um, they are going back at version seven to being totally probabilistic. In the previous versions, um, users had asked the algorithm developers to make the decision of whether a low probability um, small precip was precip or wasn't precip. Basically, the Bayesian technique just says there's potentially water in this profile. And they felt very uncomfortable because what they were asked to do was make a decision for a user at a particular location. So the only way they could do that is use global climatologies. So that often led to, it led to the global means being almost perfect in some senses when compared to other products. However, the regional uh, means could be vastly different depending upon whether you accepted that um, low probability um, small precip as, as real precip or not. So um, the developer has gone back to saying, I'm, a, I'm using a Bayesian technique. The Bayesian technique has uh, limitations. Uh, it's up to the user to make a determination whether uh, this is real precip, this, this low probability, uh, low uh, rain rate is 
real precip or not. Well, however, they did also add a precipitation yes, no flag that users can use. So if they get a very low probability, low uh, rate um, rain, they can look at that yes, no, and see whether the algorithm developer thought it would be useful or not. It's important to understand globally, somehow that water has got to get back into the, into the atmosphere. Otherwise, uh, on a global basis, um, you'll, you'll get incorrect results. However, if you're dealing with a level two data and a level three data, you have to take this into account. Otherwise, um, you, you'll get incorrect values either regionally or globally. So uh, these are the useful URIs for you. Um, the, the first one in red is the most important because that gives you the file specifications, uh, the algorithm theoretical basis documents as it become available and the release notes. And generally, we don't issue the release notes and the ATBDs until the release of the data itself. If you're interested in getting uh, GPM data, uh, you can register at this location. If you have any questions, um, send to the help desk. If you have any real-time questions, um, send to me since I run the uh, real-time system. And um, you might be interested that in 80% of the time, uh, GPROF comes out in under an hour, an hour or under. And um, we all the requirements, even the, for iMerge, um, the early product comes out four hours after data collection, and the late product comes out 14 hours after data collection. And I believe I've caught you up some time, and that's all that I have. Thank you very much. So this kind of this was uh, really this talk I think was containing very very important information for all the people who are working with GPM not only in the uh, uh, Excelsior project but also in the whole region. We thank you very much for this detailed view. Um, I will really now go and and check the new files from 2018 myself. <laughs> uh, thank you for this hint. Um, our next talk is from Bernadette Weinzier. She is from University of Vienna, and she will talk about uh, the A-Life field campaign. Uh, I think we heard it uh, several times today, and uh, I'm looking forward to this overview. Please, Bernadette, go ahead. Thank you very much, Johannes, for the introduction. I am trying to share my screen here. So... So do you see it full screen now? Yes, now we see it full screen. Okay. And is there something from my, it's only the presentation, is it? Yes, it's, it's the, only the presentation. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much um, for the invitation to this workshop. Um, I'm quite um, happy that I can talk about the ALF experiment. And it's also nice to see that um, uh, ALIFE was also in, in previous talks um, involved. So what was ALIFE? It was an aircraft mission in 2017. And the overall goal of ALIFE was to investigate the properties of mixtures of absorbing aerosol, in particular mineral dust and black carbon, during the atmospheric lifetime. So we wanted to get a new data set of key parameters of these mixtures. We wanted to understand microphysical and optical properties and study also potential links between the presence of those absorbing particles and aerosol li layer lifetime and remove them. And as we have heard in previous talks today, the Mediterranean is a, or in particular the Eastern Mediterranean is a very good place to study aerosol mixtures. Um, and I have brought a few photographs uh, from the ALIFE mission where you can see that there's different aerosol layers um, present on different days. So um, this is a map of the flight tracks um, we did with the DLR Falcon Research Aircraft. And you can see we had um, two flights from Oberpfaffenhofen where we tested instrumentation, but also did um, already some science. And then we went to Cyprus where we um, studied the aerosol mixtures, but we also had uh, flights from Cyprus to Malta and Crete. And altogether, um, we had 22 mission flights, um, about uh, 80 flight hours. 
we were quite lucky um, that we could study Saharan dust, Arabian dust, pollution, biomass burning. And we always tried to coordinate the flights with overflights of the ground sites in Limassol, in Paphos, in Ocalia, uh, and also in Austria to um, get um, independent data of those aerosol layers. And what we didn't promise at the beginning of ALEF that we would look at aerosol cloud interaction, but it turned out um, that we have so um, interesting data that we also can study this. But today I will focus on the main goals from ALEF. So in terms of instrumentation on the plane, um, we had uh, instruments which were mounted inside the Falcon research aircraft behind an isokinetic inlet. Uh, for the aerosol instrumentation. And we had um, also four instruments which were mounted at the wings of the Falcon Research aircraft. And all together, yeah. um, we were able to measure the integral number concentrations of particles larger than five and 10 nanometers. We had the total and the non-volatile aerosol size distribution particle light scattering coefficient, refractory black carbon mass absorption coefficient, also CCN concentration, then we sampled particles for offline analysis of the chemical composition. And um, as we have already seen in Oliver's talk, we had the wind lidar, which provided um, wind information, but also um, derived aerosol information. And then we had metrological data. And from the instrument mounted under the wing of the Falcon um, aircraft, we were able to measure aerosol and cloud hydrometeor size distributions in the size range um, from 500 nanometers to 30 micrometers. Um, we got images of particle shapes, liquid water content, and also aircraft velocity. If you do such a campaign, it's always interesting to ask um, how usual was the campaign period compared to um, the average um, to a climatology. And this is um, a plot showing in blue um, um, the, the daily average of the aerosol optical thickness in the Cyprus um, between 2010 and 2020. And the uh, light blue shades is the percentiles and the minimum and maximum values. And the red dots is the AOD observed during the ALIFE campaign. And what we can see, um, typically every year you have um, at the beginning and in the middle of, of April, um, outbreaks with very high AOD. And we also had this um, events and on most days we, we are within this um, maximum minimum range uh, typically observed. And um, one event where we had a very strong dust event, um, we had even higher concentrations. But overall we can say it was kind of a, a normal situation what we measured during the four weeks of the campaign. If we... Um, Look at the situation, um, we wanted to get a complicated uh, aerosol layering and we got it. And this is a satellite image of the period 26 till 29th April 2017. And the layers you can see on the, on the satellite image, it's um, uh, Middle East anthropogenic uh, and uh, mineral dust aerosol. We had Saharan dust, we had um, in the Greece area anthropogenic um, pollution and from Turkey we had um, uh, some uh, biomass burning coming. And if I combine or compare this now with the image, which I had in my proposal for this project, where we wanted to find this mixture, Saharan Arabian dust, fire, smoke, and anthropogenic pollution, here is it. And we really got what we hope to, to see. If we have such a data set, one of the questions is how to separate the data sets and uh, how to come up with typical properties for the different aerosol types. And um, we, we wanted to study those mixtures because we already also wanted to understand what is the um, natural impact of those um, aerosols, like the natural mineral dust, but also the anthropogenic uh, black carbon in particular impacts. And the first thing we did, um, this is a time series and the black line here shows um, the altitude the Falcon aircraft was flying and we run a flex part um, model uh, backwards to um, determine the aerosol types with the model um, and, and the different uh, source regions. And what we can see here, yellow is uh, dust from um, Arabia, brownish um, periods is dust um, from the Sahara. And this green um, is um, organic matter aerosol um, in, in the model. 
But when we um, came up with this aerosol classification, we not only wanted to look at the model, um, I, I don't show it here, but the model agrees quite good with the measurements uh, with respect to the timing and also with um, the uh, predicted black carbon concentrations, although the model overestimates a little bit um, the black carbon mass concentration. And so this is another uh, plot here, which shows two um, important proxies um, uh, on the y-axis. You can see the coarse mode aerosol concentration, and this is a proxy for the mineral dust. The more mineral dust is there, the more coarse mode you have there, could, but it could also be um, sea salt, which produces those coarse particles. And on the, on the x-axis, you can see the measured refractory black carbon mass concentration. And, if we, and this is the uh, entire ALIFE data set um, in uh, average to one minute data. And what you can see is um, there's two different or maybe even three different modes. There's one branch of this measurement here which shows high coarse mode concentrations and not so high black carbon. And uh, there's one other branch which shows very high black carbon concentrations but not, not so much coarse mode and something in between. And um, when we thought about um, the separation of uh, pollution and, and, and not pollution, you can de define it differently. And we thought um, um, the most, um, or to us, it made the most sense to look at the relative contribution. So we um, cut this data into um, three um, types where we say, if black carbon is low in comparison to the coarse mode number concentration, we call it clean. If uh, black carbon is high um, with respect to the um, coarse mode number concentration, we call the uh, period polluted. And the thing which is in between is moderately polluted. And if we now apply this um, uh, flex part and um, data-based um, uh, classification to the data set, so we wrote an algorithm and um, came up with uh, 12 aerosol types. Um, as a reminder here in, in, in my presentation, this is where the concentration of anthropogenic particles is large compared to the number of coarse mode mineral dust uh, particles. And we came up with this aerosol type, so clean water, rightly and polluted Saharan dust, the same for Arabian dust. And then um, we had mixtures with coarse mode, and in this case, coarse mode could be, um, for example, um, sea salt or also some um, low uh, dust concentrations, also clean, moderately, and polluted. And then we had um, mixtures with low coarse mode contributions, uh, also the three types, clean, moderately, and polluted. And for all these 12, 12 cases, we also looked at the extinction coefficient um, produced from, from the aerosol particles, and we called it backlog or ground if the extinction is smaller than one inverse megameter. Um, another interesting question is to understand where does the pollution originate from, which we observed in the data set. And also here we used the FlexPad model, and then we um, took um, a map and divided or defined 20 source areas. And these source areas, we can see it in the different colors here. Um, so. Um, and then we looked which fraction of black carbon was coming from which of those regions. And um, this is the result which you now can see for the, um, for the uh, aerosol type Saharan and mineral, uh, Saharan dust and um, Arabian dust. And again, we look at the clean, at the moderate and at the polluted um, periods. And this is what you can see here. The um, different colors are the... Um, like carbon concentrations or contributions from the different source regions. And what we can immediately see, um, the Arabian dust um, sequences contained much higher black carbon contents than the um, Saharan dust periods. And also the source regions were uh, different, if you recall the maps. So we found that for the Saharan dust, um, black carbon sources were dominated by sources in Northern Africa, uh, Morocco, um, Tunisia, and also um, uh, from the Nile Delta, but there were also some contributions from uh, Southern Europe. And if you look to the Arabian dust, um, then the black carbon uh, was dominated by sources from the Middle East, and some contributions from, uh, from the Saudi Arabian uh, region, and um, a little bit from um, Eastern Europe. 
One puzzling result of the ALIFE um, measurements um, was the scattering angstrom exponent. Um, so when we started looking into the data set, we were kind of expecting if you have um, mineral dust, the scattering angstrom exponent should be um, around zero. But um, what we found is that um, in our data set for periods containing mineral dust, um, the scattering angstrom exp uh, exponent varied between zero and two. And um, as a reminder, the scattering angstrom exponent um, is, um, tells you something about the wavelength dependency of the uh, scattering coefficient. And um, uh, it's expected to get a value of four for relay scattering, something like two for uh, polluted periods where you have a lot or many small particles and zero if you have uh, many large particles. So for example, for dust periods. The angstrom exponent is often used um, by, by many monitoring sites to um, classify periods of pollution and distinguish them from periods where you have mineral dust in the data. And um, so um, it took quite some time until we understood what is going on. And I will now show you a, a representation which is a little bit different from what you typically see for the uh, scattering angstrom exponent. So, the scattering angstrom exponent will be plotted on the y-axis and on the x-axis I will show the ratio of the cores um, to the total aerosol number concentration and dots which will appear in red um, uh, mark polluted sequences of these 12 classes, yellow marks um, moderately polluted sequences and green marks uh, clean sequences. And what we can see here, if we plot um, the scattering angstrom exponent versus this ratio of large to um, uh, large particles to the total aerosol, the picture starts to make sense. So we find for cases where we have uh, not much uh, coarse mode um, on two, then for the um, periods where we have many, many um, large particles, the scattering angstrom is uh, around zero as expected. And for the mixtures, it decreases from, uh, from two to zero, depending on the ratio of uh, coarse particle number concentration to the total um, aerosol number concentration. And in summary, we can say we have this de decreasing angst uh, scattering angstrom exponent uh, with increasing coarse mode number concentration. And um, we also would like to point out it's not a good indicator to just look at the scattering angstrom exponent to classify different um, um, events. And um, yeah, I already said this in, in, in heavily polluted periods, um, even if there were dust particles present, the scattering angstrom was around two. For the clean dust periods, it was zeros. And for the mixtures between zero and two, depending on this ratio of the course to total aerosol. Um, I'm already coming to the end. I, I did not show um, uh, results from our cloud uh, studies uh, because I thought my time is limited. In summary, um, I would uh, like to say that the ALIFE data set is a very rich data set. Um, we are also happy to share it with people if someone wants to do something with it, maybe use it for model evaluation. We do a lot of process studies with this data set. Um, we uh, classified the data set into 12 different aerosol types plus the background based on trajectories, uh, Lagrangian um, particle dispersion model simulations and in situ data. And this classification re reflects a relative contribution of pollutants uh, with respect to the natural aerosol. Um, in, in summary, the Arabian dust um, contained higher pollution concentration absolute values compared to Saharan dust. Um, the black carbon origin in the Arabian dust mixture was dominated by sources uh, from the Middle East and the black carbon in the Saharan dust mixtures was uh, dominated by sources from Northern Africa and the Nile Delta. The, um, I talked a lot about the scattering angstrom. It decreases with the increasing ratio of the coarse mode number concentration um, to the uh, total um, aerosol particle number concentration. And this is actually the physical basis for this parameter, the ratio of small to large particles. Um, the scattering angstrom alone is not a good indicator for aerosol classification. Um, there should be also other, um, or other parameters be used. And um, we are currently prepared to summarize the, um, uh, or give an overview of the field experiment and present selected highlights. And there will also be a special
complex aerosol conditions uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm not completely up to date, but I think Eleni will tell us, do we make the Q&A session now or is it at the end of the conference? Um, I think we'll do the Q&A session in the end of the workshop. And as we are a bit late with time, uh, I would suggest to take five minutes so that we don't make it uh, too tiring for the attendees for the next session. So uh, I would say uh, we should continue in, in five minutes, just a short break. So see you all uh, in five minutes, Ben. Okay, see you. Thank you, Johannes, for sharing this session.
So I think we can continue with the next uh, session. Uh, the chair for our next session is uh, Dr. Silas Michaelidis from uh, the Cyprus University of Technology and the Radosin Center of Excellence. And the topic of this session is climate and weather modeling in and for the MENA region. Uh, thank you, Dr. Silas Michaelidis for chairing this session and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eleni. Yes, we are moving towards the last uh, session of this uh, workshop. Eleni has already announced the title. It's about uh, climate and weather modeling in and for the MENA region. We have uh, six, six talks in this uh, session, each 15 minutes, and adherence to this 15 minutes limitation will be greatly appreciated, appreciated so that uh, we finish in time. And there will be a question and answer session after that, where everybody will have the chance to ask questions to the presenters. So we, we go straight ahead with the first presentation by Dr. Alexia Tsuni, uh, who will talk about earth observation assimilation for real time flood monitoring and response. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending. We will present here our flood hub system an integrated near real time flood monitoring system based on modeling, multi source earth observation, and crowd source data, which supports the decision makers in flood risk management. Flat Hub uh, is developed at the Beyond Center of Earth Observation Research and Satellite Remote Sensing under the coordination of Dr. Harris Contoes. Beyond is part of the Institute for Astronomy, Astrophysics, Space Applications and Remote Sensing at the National Observatory of Athens in Greece. The services of the Beyond Center address a wide spectrum of disasters, forest fires, dust events, floods, geophysical disasters, and moreover, we provide services for solar energy, regional climate, mosquito-borne diseases, and COVID-19. We assimilate different data sources from various monitoring systems, polar orbit and gestationary satellites, manned and unmanned aerial vehicles, in-situ networks, as well as crowdsourcing. Let's now focus on floods, which is unfortunately the deadliest type of disaster, responsible for the 43.5% of deaths in 2019. What is more, as we can see in this infographic, flood occurrence has significantly increased in 2019 compared to the 2009-2018 annual average. Similarly, as presented in this infographic, the number of flood events has extremely increased during the last decade compared to the previous one. Flood has become the most frequent disasters by far. So the Flood Hub service of the Beyond Center was activated for the first time in 2017, immediately after the deadly flood event in Mantra in Attica, Greece. This extreme flood event affected the urban and suburban area of Mandra with landslides, extensive million euro damages to property and infrastructure, and 24 recorded fatalities, rendering it the deadliest flood event in Greece in the last 40 years. For this case, we conducted a detailed study and set up a web GIS application, which was forwarded to all the competent civil protection authorities in Greece. It demonstrated the possibilities we have on the one hand in flood risk assessment for the better and timely preparedness of the civil protection and local authorities, and on the other hand in the systematic monitoring and the real time knowledge for the operational management of the crisis. Here we can see the simulation of the maximum flood extent with zoom in the urban area of Mandra. We observe that the result of the hydraulic modeling in blue approaches with a satisfactory accuracy the result of the flood extent mapping using satellite remote sensing in pink. We have now upgraded our flood hub system into an integrated near real time flood monitoring system based on modeling multi source earth observation and crowd source data. This advanced flood hub service is built around a fully scalable and transferable modular architecture that allows the near real time ingestion and assimilation of hydrometeorological parameters measured at three in situ telemetric hydrometeorological stations, satellite data, and crowdsource data in a multi source data fusion concept. The processed and model data are stored in a data cube into the BOSS GIS RDBMS, the latter offering a flexible environment for flood analysis and comparisons to facilitate the derivation 
of the most common hazard parameters, which for floods are the, the return period, the antecedent soil moisture condition, and the rainfall duration. The innovation of the flood hub system lies in the integration of these different data sources so as to deliver a reliable operational awareness picture of the crisis every 5 to 15 minutes to all the relevant authorities, namely on three levels, municipality, region and civil protection general secretariat. It offers increased reliability through a continuous validation and optimization of the results, automation in assimilating flood modeling in real time, computational efficiency, openness, flexibility, scalability, transferability to other river basins, and the speed to meet rapid awareness during the crisis. So for the needs of our upgraded operational flood hub system, in 2020, last year, we installed three state-of-the-art telemetric intrometrological stations in three critical locations of the Mandra River Basin. This was co-founded by the Hellenic Petroleum SA and the European program SMERPS of Era Planet in collaboration with the Attica region and the Metrica company. We have recently upgraded the network in the framework of the CleanPact project. This here is our web platform with the three telemetric hydrometrological stations in blue, collecting and transmitting data in near real time in order to cover the operational needs of the flood hub system. The first station has been installed at the entrance junction of the Mandra city, downstream of the confluence of the Agia Caterini stream with the Sure stream. This station operates with electricity provided by the region of Attica, so it can provide data every five minutes. The second station has been installed upstream on the diversion, the new plan that the new work that was planned and uh, was finally uh, delivered this year, previous year, of the Aie Caterini stream to the Sure stream. This station operates with a solar panel and provides data every 15 minutes. And the third station has been installed in the Sure stream in the mountain area. This station operates with a solar panel and provides data every 15 minutes. That of the Beyond Center can now provide to the relevant operational authorities every 5 to 15 minutes measurements for 10 parameters, as we can see in this screen of our web platform. And we collect and analyze all these near real time measurements using depth, for example, to choose the exact scenario that best fits to the in situ measurements. Moreover, the system calculates automatically the five day antecedent rainfall in order to estimate the category of the curve number, which relates to the antecedent soil moisture conditions, namely dry, average, or wet. In addition, we have developed a dynamic crowdsourcing platform to receive real-time flood extent and water level estimations from certified users, such as trained civil protection and fire brigade staff, as well as volunteers, for disaster management using machine learning techniques. This platform is accessible from the homepage of our Beyond Center, through the Flat Hub service section. In this video here, we will show how we give access to all the certified users of the civil protection, the fire brigade, the municipalities, the association of volunteers, etc. The Flat Hub platform provides a first assessment of the flooded areas based on the near real time measurements from these three hydrometeorological stations, which we can see here as purple dots. This flood extent assessment is automatically updated every 5 to 15 minutes with the new in situ measurements by the telemetric stations. Moreover, in this video, we can see that each time there is a new input by some user on the dynamic crowdsourcing platform, the system recalculates the flood extent in real time and presents the updated map to all the connected users. Of course, the more data we have, the more accurate estimates our system provides. Certified users have access to a number of flat hubs user interface components, as we see here, allowing them to enable position tracking on their mobile and tablet devices via GPS and that in situ water depth estimations, or alternatively, manually insert such location point information from their PC and laptop. They can also retract, edit, or erase already submitted observations by them from the server and resubmit them with revised attributes. They can publish observations to the community in a very simple and user-friendly way. And finally, they can upload geotagged photos to these location points from which we can extract useful information. 
all these elements are combined with a hydrologic and hydraulic simulation that we have performed from the Mandra River Basin. As we can see in this map, we have now divided the river basin into 19 sub-basins with different CN values for more accurate estimations. We use the rainfall IDF curve of Kuchoyangs and Baluchos, and we consider a distribution according to the worst profile method and the concentration time according to the Kirpich SES method. We use the open access HEC HMS hydrological model, and we insert the rainfall data via HEC DSS, as shown in this schematic diagram here. We apply the SESCN method for extracting the excess from the gross rainfall and the unit hydrograph for propagating the surface runoff to the basin outlet. We run scenarios and we export flood hydrographs in an automated way for various combinations of return periods and rainfall duration for the three antecedent moisture condition categories. We use the open access hydraulic model HECRAS and we execute the scenarios with a spatial resolution of 2D mesh at 10 meters based on the dam provided to us by the National Cadaster and Mapping Agency SA of Greece at 2 meters spatial resolution. We add the banks and the road network through brake lines as well as the flow hydrographs for each stream of the hydrographic network. We present here the results for the combinations of return period 50, 100, 200, 50, 500, and 1,000 years, and the rainfall durations 3, 6, and 9 hours, and all the three antecedent moisture condition categories 1, 2, and 3. Here you can see the range for 50 years return period, 100 years return period, 200 years, 500 years, and finally 1,000 years return period. In this map, we present as an example of our upgraded system, the comparison between the actual and simulated flood extent of 2017 inside the urban area of Mardra. In pink, we can see the very high resolution satellite-based mapping, while in blue color, the simulated extent of the scenario with return period 1,000 years, CN3, the wet conditions, and rainfall duration six hours. It is obvious that the accuracy of the flood extent estimation has been further improved. Therefore, the Flood Hub system is a useful tool in the hands of the relevant authorities and key stakeholders, supporting their decision-making process. It is in line with the requirements for the implementation of the EU Floods Directive 2007-60, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the geo-societal benefit areas. In order to ensure the adequacy and reliability of the crowdsourcing data that are ingested in the FlatCap system, we organize workshops for our certified users on how to use our web and mobile crowdsourcing platform. Here we can see photos of our trainings at the municipality of Mandra and at the operational center of the fire service. Right. By the way, FlatHub has received media attention in addition to the scientific interest as we can see in these print screens of the news agencies. On behalf of the Flat Hub team and all the other teams of the Beyond Center, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsumi, for your very interesting presentation indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I call uh, Dr. Harris Condoes. His talk will be on uh, Earth, Earth observation based early warning system for mosquito-borne diseases, an operational application in EU. The floor is yours, uh, Harris. Th thank, you, th thank you very much, Silas. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Perfect, yes. Okay, and you see my screen, I believe. So Perfect, thank you very yes. much again. Um, it's uh, it indeed my privilege to speak on behalf of the EUA uh, consortium. Uh, which is uh, comprising of um, a good number and of esteemed colleagues and key professionals at European Union level. And uh, all these organizations are uh, actually dealing with the main problem of mosquito-borne disease control 
and the region in European, but also non-European uh, territories. Uh, my presentation is uh, about uh, how it's possible to use big Earth observation data uh, for the generation of an early warning system for uh, anticipation of mosquito-borne disease outbreak. And I'll present you today an operational application of a such a system in the European Union territory. Let me just uh, recall that this EUA consortium and the system that has been developed is the fruit of a series of research actions, voluntary actions actions actually that uh, have been undertaken in the framework of the Eurogeo um, action group for epidemics. I have the honor to coordinate this action group and uh, I'm really privileged to work with all these organizations, scientists, scientists researchers and data providers who are uh, providing their expertise and skills on a voluntary basis for the development of this uh, uh, system. And uh, of course, what we try to address is the problem of, um, of the disease outbreak in Europe, uh, a, a, a problem which is re-emerging, especially during the last 10 years. As you see on this uh, slide, there is a lot of uh, spread of these uh, diseases all over Europe in, during the last uh, uh, 10 years, actually. And you will see here to the left that there is a, a a, a, a good number of some thousands of cases of human cases that have been reported in all in all these different countries of Europe in uh, in relation to worst uh, Nile virus, malaria, dengue fever, Zika, and chikungunya viruses, uh, most of them being responsible for the encephalitis disease. And so what is EWA? EWA is at the same time a vision, a network, uh, but also a system. Uh, a scalable, reliable, and uh, sustainable early warning system, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned, relies on the integration of Earth observation data and the combined use of the Earth observation data together with the domological, epidemiological, and socioeconomic data so as to forecast the uh, mosquito abundance, the pathogen spread, and the uh, disease outbreak at, uh, um, at, any, at any level, from local to regional or uh, national, even and continent level. And of course, we are addressing priorities and we are dedicating to meet priorities of sustainable development goals uh, 3, 11, and 13 uh, for good health and well being, for sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. So as it is a geo uh, activity, it uh, builds up on the triptych, the geo triptych advocate, advocates and deliver. We advocate exhaustive inventories, analytic inventories of uh, capacity, skills, uh, priorities, needs and gaps to be fit in at the European Union level. Uh, at the same time, it engages a big stake, a community of stakeholders, um, uh, public health organizations, civil protection authorities, regional authorities, together with scientists, researchers, uh, service providers, and data providers, and it delivers <clears throat> A, 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 a set of digital uh, early warning services in the domain of um, uh, mosquito and mosquito borne disease outbreak, together with um, a network of stakeholders of European and non European organizations acting uh, in the domain. And of course, an action plan, a roadmap, uh, which is providing the European standards towards setting a standard for service, but at the same time, quality. Um, uh, level of the service. For the time being, uh, we are a consortium of 15 partners from five countries, Greece, uh, Serbia, Italy, France and Germany. And uh, uh, of course, it is an open partnership scheme as it is a voluntary action of GEO. It is uh, open and it uh, welcomes uh, other countries and organizations acting in the domain, uh, specialists from for the specific area, for the specific domains. Uh, to uh, to join and uh, being on board and act uh, with us by bringing data, expertise and knowledge from their own countries. As we uh, attempt to generate and uh, deliver a European system, the, most, the, the, the more the countries and the bigger the data, uh, the better the outcome to get up to uh, the level of the European Union continent solution. Of course, next to us, there is a network of 37 stakeholders uh, from um, uh, European and 
non-European uh, countries acting globally in the domain, from including also organizations from India, Latin America, US, uh, all this uh, being um, a, a, in, the, in a, a, a multidisciplinary team of uh, acting in the areas of medicine, public health, veterinary, biology, earth observation, computer science, and uh, modeling. In general, AI, as you see on this slide, is exploits open and freely available data. This uh, ensures transferability and scalability of the system in other areas. It is using uh, a, a European technology. It is uh, acting, uh, uh, accessing and uh, uh, exploiting on a continuous basis Copernicus data and Copernicus contribution mission data, also Copernicus core services. Uh, it is um, uh, using a, a, a suite of automated uh, uh, pipelines and scripts for earth observation and homological and auxiliary data ingestion, and it is a fully operational service. Today, and especially this year in 2021, the, the, the system is uh, provided on a fully operational uh, basis in all the five countries. The system is uh, providing uh, 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 continuous uh, ingestion of mosquito trap data in situ data, uh, public health authority data, so as to uh, continuously uh, um, feed into the system the epidemiological data from public health authorities, as well as statistical information. At the same time, the system allows the federated access to many different portals of Copernicus and non uh, Copernicus and Copernicus contribution mission search observation data. Sentinel data, but also data which are um, from other missions such as MODIS, Latsat 7 or 8 and so on, and also data which are accessible through the Geosport. It, uh, the system is um, empowered by a suite of APIs which are developed to be fully automatic uh, to allow uh, continuous and uh, automatic data harvesting from the portals and the repositories I just presented before, as well as providing a, a automatic data pre-processing and index data derivation and the creation of the data and conversion of the data in the format to be ingested into the databases of the system. Of course, here at that level, we're using advanced European technologies such as the DIAS platform, so as to, uh, um, to have uh, cloud IT and uh, storage capacity it is uh, in the specific case of AI, we are using a lot of the Creo DS platform, but also Google Earth Engine in order to have continuous access to, uh, and, uh, to big data uh, storage of Landsat 7, Lavatsat 8, because what we want in the end to have is to have access to the satellite data and all the other type of data for the last uh, uh, 10 years over the entire Europe. So all this uh, um, um, infrastructure uh, is very useful for us. Uh, we are dealing with the uh, big data management. I mean, just to give you an example for, example for the time being, at any time we do a, a, a prediction uh, in, in, through our models for mosquito abundance or for human uh, case risk, we are dealing with more than uh, uh, 278 terabytes of data um, uh, processed on the fly. And uh, for that, of course, uh, we are using uh, uh, advanced um, uh, data cube and uh, database technology so as to be able uh, to retrieve any slice, any piece of information at any time and uh, in any area um, uh, over Europe uh, for the last 10 years, as it is required, as it is uh, uh, necessary to be uh, the right input for the predictions uh, and the predictive models. And of course, we have developed the proper uh, architecture, the proper uh, tiers that uh, allow the uh, analysis of the data, the generation of the proper feature engineers, engineering uh, and feature spaces, sorry, and um, uh, create the proper relations of the data to be ingested into our models. We have two types of prediction models, the models which are predicting the abundance of uh, mosquitoes, the population of mosquitoes actually for the uh, next 10 days, for the next month, or even the entire season. So we have uh, data-driven models uh, which are um, uh, uh, of uh, 
uh, generic type like the mammoth model, for example, um, or the bad model, which is not that generic. It is a, a local specific model, site specific model, which has been developed according to the priorities as they have been uh, designed and set by the, the local public health authority. But also we run uh, human case risk prediction models such as Mimesis or VAR. Again, this is a generic model, uh, which is applicable in other areas of, uh, in every area of, uh, of Europe, but the VAR model as well, which is also site specific, also developed for the, according to the specifications as they have been set by the, uh, the local user. The Mammoth model, just to give you an idea, is a data-driven model which uh, um, predicts, uh, forecasts actually the population of mosquitoes, different types of mosquitoes, either being Culex species or Anopheles or Tiger or other, any other type of uh, mosquito species uh, in any place of Europe. So it is a, a generic uh, a model that it is applicable and transferable and reproducible in any other area of Europe. And of course, this is a very big advantage because it is providing us the possibility to uh, the capability to, to, to generate comparative studies and comparative results at any place at Europe. At the same time, Amuth is composed of more than 32 in-house developed Python functions, uh, which are based on the use of machine learning libraries for uh, in five operational mo models. Uh, the, the same is I mean, the Mimesis model. This is another type of model. This is for the prediction of human risks. Uh, this is a total dynamical model, mathematical model based on, uh, the, sol on the solution of uh, 14 uh, differential equations of 50, 25 parameters each. And this is solved any time. I mean, that uh, we, are at, uh, we want to predict uh, the larvae mosquito abundance, the infected mosquitoes, the infected humans, RO, and uh, human risks. Of course, all we have developed in the AOA before it becomes operational, it has uh, undergone a very strict validation process. And uh, here you see and what is the type of the validation we are performing. To the to the left, you see what uh, uh, have been in the last year, the last summer of two, uh, oh no, two, two summers before 2019, the human cases as they have been reported in the different municipalities of Greece. And uh, to the right, you see what has been predicted by the model. So you see that there is a very good fit between the observed uh, the observed cases and the model plans. And uh, I have to tell you today that uh, our um, services through AOA have received uh, the TRL level of uh, eight or nine that are fully operational after having reached the uh, um, uh, validation level of accuracy of the order of 9 to 92 to 95 percent and uh, of course it was uh, years of research behind until we we reach this level of validation and uh, operationalization and because it is a user-driven um, uh, approach uh, it provides uh, the proper um, portals for the users to get access to the information uh, in terms of um, maps um, uh, risk maps uh, mosquito abundance maps uh, and reports, the reports that uh, are delivered on a, on a, fifth, on a big, big weekly basis to the end users are also uploaded into the portal, into the AOA portal to be uh, consulted by the other authorities as well. In uh, this year, uh, the, actually it was per, uh, implemented for the first time on a fully operational uh, basis the year before in 2020 in four regions, uh, in five regions, sorry, four of them in, the, in the Greece and uh, one in Italy. And for um, this year, and it has started already during the last two years providing its services operationally over nine uh, European uh, regions in the five countries, Greece, Italy, France, Germany and uh, Serbia. Uh, in addition to the services I mentioned before about the human risk, uh, the human risk uh, mapping, which is delivered on a monthly basis, or the mosquito population risk map, which is uh, delivered on a big weekly basis, we also provide on a five-day basis the so-called um, um, mosquito nuisance uh, information. This is a, a, a smartphone application, uh, which is, of course, very useful for the locals, for people, for tourists, etc., that are visiting an area, uh, as well as um, uh, the mosquito abundance information, which uh, um, is, uh, is uh, uh, especially in the specific region of Central Macedonia, that it is uh, very sensitive and it is too much impacted by mo 
by mosquitoes, the assessment of the mosquito population is taking place at the level, at the very fine level of the municipality, uh, which means that uh, every um, two weeks we calculate the, the mosquito abundance risk in more than 1,040 municipalities in the region of Central Macedonia. In conclusion, the AUA system uh, we say it is a sustainable and cost-effective system. Sustainable, why? Because the partners have agreed and they have signed a partnership agreement to continue working together on a completely voluntary basis, providing their data for the next, at least for the next five years. And uh, of course, um, uh, this uh, provides a lot of sustainability and capability to us to continue developing our research. When we say cost-effective, it is the actual Actually, the fact that it is providing a lot of information to mosquito controllers and to the local authorities to target their control actions and their um, um, their immediate actions, which of course are costly actions, uh, so as to target to the areas that are really um, uh, uh, that are expected to suffer in the next uh, weeks or in the next months uh, um, by, 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 by the uh, increase of mosquito population or um, uh, expected uh, human cases of West Nile virus. Uh, and, and not to expand the activity in all uh, the municipalities of the region, which is uh, a lot of cost. At the same time, the AOA system is using, as I mentioned, bigger observation data and advanced AI sciences. It is a system which has proven to be applicable and scalable and reliable and transferable to other areas of Europe. And uh, as I mentioned, it is, uh, and we, we will attempt and we will attempt to become fully operational at the European Union level. Our aim is to create in the end, uh, in the, under the flag, uh, the flag of the Eurogeo, a state of the art tool that becomes to be a European standard in the area of vector and mosquito borne diseases. So, uh, on behalf of the AOA consortium, um, of uh, this multidisciplinary team working on a completely voluntary basis, on, but on a systematic basis at the same time, for the development of this innovative uh, research and um, this innovative system, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to expand further with you. And of course, if you have any interest in joining this consortium, this partnership, uh, I will be happy to explain with you and um, and um, exchange with you uh, how this can be feasible. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kondoes. I hope you can hear me, Eleni. Yes, perfect. That's okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you for your talk on this very alarming issue of uh, disease spreading by mosquitoes, these very annoying insects, anyhow. <laughs> Uh, so we have the next speaker, who is uh, Eleni Luli, who is going to speak on precipitation and drought monitoring with ground-based expand radars in Cyprus. Eleni, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mikhailidis. Let me just okay share my screen. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Now on another uh, row. Uh, I am Eleni Luli, and I'm a doctoral researcher at the Cyprus University of Technology and the Radosani Center of Excellence. My PhD research focuses on uh, drought monitoring in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So today I will be presenting some preliminary results uh, from the work I did by now. So my presentation today focuses on pre precipitation and drought monitoring with ground-based expand radars in Cyprus. I will start with an introduction into the topic and uh, some information about the study area. And then I will continue with uh, some information about the data I am using and the initial state of the two data sets. I will go on showing some uh, information about the interpolation method and the slicing of the expand uh, data and the calculation of the precipitation rate. And then I will uh, finish with uh, some uh, preliminary results and a short discussion on the topic. Um, starting with the definition for drought, uh, drought is reported as a rainfall deficit with uh, regard to its long-term mean 
and it affects a large area for a certain time period. Um, contrary to other natural disasters, uh, drought has a variety of unique feature, features. As it is a multidimensional phenomenon, it starts imperceptibly, means that um, we cannot really say when exactly a drought uh, has started, as for example, we can do uh, for a flood or a fire event. It advances uh, slowly and cumulatively, and we can see its consequences um, on a long-term basis, and they show up gradually. So due to this uh, peculiarity, uh, research has shown that uh, weather-based parameters and indices are not always uh, adequate uh, to estimate the temporal and the spatial uh, drought features. And uh, researchers distinguish between four major drought types, which are the meteorological, the agricultural uh, soil moisture drought, the hydrological drought and the socioeconomic drought. Today, I will be focusing on the meteorological drought as uh, the results have to do with uh, precipitation. Some information about the study area. The, the study area is Cyprus, and um, Cyprus is located in the southeast Mediterranean basin. And it's, Cyprus is considered as a case study for the eastern Mediterranean region. It has a mild uh, to dry to hot summers and cool to mild to wet winters. The mean, the mean annual precipitation fluctuates between 400 and 500 millimeters with a um, decreased tendency in the coming years. And on the contrary, the mean annual uh, temperature has an increased tendency and it varies from 14 degrees uh, to 18 degrees, also depending on the topography of the island. Uh, there are over 100 water dams and surface reservoirs uh, operating on a daily basis in Cyprus. And these provide uh, water also for the agricultural activities that include uh, both annual and permanent crops. Uh, you can see some examples of the, the crops uh, in Cyprus. And um, since droughts occur frequently in Cyprus and they are expected to be more frequent in the coming years, they are a source of uh, various problems to the economy, to the environment, and to the agricultural production in the island. Um, continue with the data. Uh, for my work, I'm using two different data sets. Um, the first are data from the two plant position indicator stations operated by the Department of Meteorology in Cyprus. Um, Dr. Nicolaidis also gave some more information about these stations in the morning. Um, each station is composed of an expand Doppler dual polarization radar that provides continuous information on the estimation uh, of rainfall and hydrometeor classification. Um, the radars have a spatial resolution of 0.1 degrees and a radius of 150 kilometers. They provide um, raw information with a frequency of approximately 10 minutes. And they rotate through 360 degrees and they provide uh, surveillance scans for eight different angles. So for uh, every 10 minutes, we have uh, eight different uh, scans for, from eight different elevation angles. Um, here we can see uh, where the two stations are located in Cyprus. You can see one in the area of Paphos in the west part of the island, and one in the area of Larnaca in the um, uh, east part of the island. And with a radius of 150 kilometers, uh, we have a full coverage uh, of the island of Cyprus. The other uh, data set that I am uh, using in my work is the GPM uh, data uh, from the level 2A. Uh, here we can see the, uh, the pre-processing that is uh, implemented to this. It's already implemented in this product. 
And uh, for my study, I'm using the uh, vertical profile of the reflectivity factor uh, with the attenuation correction. Um, here I have a better clarification of the initial state of the two data sets. Uh, the GPM data set, as I've mentioned, is a level 2A data set, and the expand from the two radar stations can be considered as level 0 uh, data uh, as they are uh, provided in a raw format. Um, here, uh, there is um, a flowchart uh, of uh, the processing I've done for the, for the data. Um, as you can uh, see, there was uh, more processing needed for the expand data set as it was a uh, level uh, zero data set. So uh, I started with the pre-processing of the um, uh, range, height, and distance calculation, and georeferencing the data. And then for uh, both data sets, it was needed that they are uh, on the same uh, grid so that they can be comparable. So in order to do that, I have um, implemented a new universal grid that uh, is the same for both data sets, and I have interpolated uh, the two data sets on the universal grid. Here we can see some preliminary uh, results from the interpolated GPM uh, data. And from the um, radar data, these are some ref reflectivity uh, plots. But um, here there is there was a, another issue as um, the interpolated uh, expand data are on a conical form. So I have uh, simplified this a bit with this diagram. Uh, you can imagine that uh, having this conical form with the expand data as the um, radar scans, scans with an elevation angle in 360 degrees. And uh, the GPM data uh, are provided in bins. So we have um, um, the height in a form of bin. So these two data sets can still uh, not, cannot, can still uh, be uh, directly compared. So in order to, to tackle this problem, I have also interpolated the, the height of the expand data uh, in order to basically uh, slice this uh, cone. Um, here are the results after slicing. You cannot really uh, see any difference as there are many uh, points. Um, but I have also tried to simplify this um, uh, plots after slicing, you can imagine that the expand has this form of the of the rings, and now uh, these uh, data sets can be compared in terms of uh, height as well. Um, after uh, comparing the reflectivity, the next step would be the calculation of the precipitation rate. And to calculate the precipitation rate, um, I have used the marshall Parmel uh, formula, which is the one you can uh, see now on your screens. I have also here some uh, preliminary results from the precipitation rate. We can uh, see here as well that there is an offset between the, um, the two data sets, and that's why there is a need to calibrate the um, the data and the calibration will be done uh, using the reflectivity uh, measurements and then the calibrated data sets will be converted to precipitation rate. Uh, so to uh, close this presentation, I would like to mention again that uh, the basis for the intercomparison uh, of the two data sets is done. Uh, as the interpolation uh, poses an important step for the future work, because 
it was really important to have uh, two comparable data sets. So the next step is the calibration of the ground-based data uh, using the GPM uh, data as a reference data set. This might sound a bit odd, but um, concerning the, um, um, the calibration that has been done on the GPM data and the calibration also above uh, the ocean, we can consider that um, uh, uh, it's, they are accurate enough to calibrate the raw ground-based data. And as the GPM gives just one scan for every 10 days above Cyprus, and the um, radars uh, of the meteorological service give uh, scans for every 10 minutes, it's really important to take advantage of the um, vast amount of data that can be provided from the two radars. So uh, with this, uh, the overall outcome is expected to be uh, an accurate and reliable data set that will uh, further contribute to the development of an automated method for the estimation of the precipitation budget over the area of Cyprus. Um, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I think we can uh, see them uh, after what's in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Eleni. If I may add that uh, the use of the two Cyprus radars is, uh, you know, one of the first applications ever because these radars are quite new. And uh, Eleni's uh, treatment of the data is one of the first ever done with this um, data sets. Thank you very much, Eleni. We move on to the next presentation by Geronimo Escribano uh, from Barcelona Supercomputer Center. And the title is uh, Impact of Assimilating Spaceborne LiDAR Dust Extinction in Northern Africa and Middle East. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this workshop. I'm very happy to be here. I will show you our work on the assimilation of the LIVAS product. Uh, so sorry to, to double the, the, the slide, but I think it's important to acknowledge my co-authors uh, because they are, the list is too long to, be, <laughs> to put in the other slide. Uh, mainly from BSC, of course, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, Kit Noah Tropos. Um, for, for who don't know what is data simulation, basically uh, aims to combine data simulation, the observations and the prior information that we have, basically the models, uh, to estimate the real state of the, the atmosphere. Um, this is useful for, for forecast and reanalysis. And basically when, when we do this, we call it an analysis, is to find a, a good trajectory close to real state. And then we use to use this analysis to start forecast again and to introduce again observation and create a new analysis, etc. Um, the motivation is basically that in, in most of the operational centers, uh, when they do a simulation of aerosols, they use aerosol optical depth, which is uh, information in 2D with a very good coverage, but 2D anyway. And when we look at the forecast, at the vertical profiles of, of the forecast, uh, they are coming basically from the information of the models of the prior. Uh, on the other side, we have a vertical distribution of uh, aerosols from, from spaceborne LIDAR. And the question is if we can include this in, in data simulation for, for forecast, uh, which is the impact of it, and if it is compatible with the current AUD assimilation in, in the operational system. Um, also, we are very interested in, in, in know about the narrow footprint that these LIDARs can have and how, how can this impact in the assimilation. Uh, we focus in dust. So basically, we, pro we do a series of experiments of data simulation with our model, which is the Monarch model. Uh, we use the local ensemble transform Kalman filter. We only simulate dust, and then we assimilate two basically basically two dust assets. One is the is dust optical depth that we take from the blue from beers, 
on the other is the LIVA product, which is the extinction coefficient, uh, which is issued from Calliope. We compare this against uh, DOD from Aronet with an angstrom expand less than 0.3, and with ground based LIDAR from Polynet in the Sicari and Pretech campaign. Um, so, as I told you, uh, we, we set experiments basically by assimilating these different products. We have two products and we create five experiments. The first is only assimilating the LIVAS extinction coefficient. Uh, a second is only assimilating the BIRS DOD. Then a third one could be assimilating both together. And then just to, to know about the, the impact of the footprint of, of the LIVAS, we create this subset of, of the dusty blue, which is optical depth, but only in the overpass of the Calliope. So this is, this is the number of observations for it. And finally, the, the combination between the LIVAS and, the, and this subset of, of beers. Uh, when we, we have three types of simulations, one is the control, which is ensemble, without any kind of assimilation. And then we have the analysis, which is include the, all, all the observations, and then the forecast that are initialized with the analysis of the day before, and they are used to create again the analysis for, for the next day. In, in our model, for example, as you can see on the left and right, this is the average of the two months experiment that we perform. Uh, we have uh, overestimation. This is this is the model average, and this is the deep blue average. So respect to with the deep blue, we have overestimation in the in most of the Sahara and part of the Atlantic and underestimation elsewhere. Then each of these columns are the different experiments where we assimilate all these data sets. And it can be seen that basically this is the forecast and the analysis that in the third row is the analysis minus the forecast. It's called the increments and it shows the influence of the observation into, into the analysis. And you can see that there, there are different uh, pattern for 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 the for for the deep blue that we can have increase here and decrease here than for the levas that we have a decrease everywhere but all of them decrease in Baudelaire that is where we have most uh, overestimation um, in when when we look at the vertical profile these are, are are the dust extinction coefficient for for this region here but the first row I will show you is, is all the domain. So in, in the first panel, we have the last extinction coefficient. And in the last panel, we have the change with respect to the control experiment of these experiments. So basically, in, when we assimilate the blue, which is these two red lines here, we shift the vertical profiles because we are biased. So we shift a little bit. But when we assimilate the, the LIDAR, the LIVAS product, we have a different pattern, a different shape in the analysis of the of the of the model and also in the forecast here so that that means that the assimilation of vertical profile changed the the, the, the profile of, of the model and, and hopefully is better than before um, we evaluate kind of evaluate this with uh, defining some scores some typical scores uh, in the middle, in the middle, yeah, in the middle, you can see the comparison with the error on it. When you have the bias here, the correlation, and some error scores, the green bars are the control without assimilation, the red is the forecast, and the blue are the analysis. And you can see that, for example, the correlation improves for all the data sets that we assimilate, and same for the errors score, they are better for all, all the data sets. Uh, when we assimilate the blue in particular, we have better scores for the errors and for the uh, correlation coefficient. But nevertheless, when we assimilate LIVAS, we also have improvements in these in this scores. Um, in terms of the profiles, we compare our model with, with the LIDARs from, from these two campaigns here. Uh, I there are three LIDARs. I only show here the plot of two of them, one in Limassol and one in Haifa. Uh, you can see the plume. This is the SDF, SDS was forecast uh, for the 19 April 2017. And you can see the plume going to the Eastern Mediterranean and passing through it. Um, this second row are the 
observations by, by the LIDARs of dust extinction coefficients. Then we have in the third row, the forecast of the model and, and the last row, the analysis of the model for, for some experiments. Um, you can see that in, in the green line, for example, which is the control is much more overestimated than, than the analysis. And that's, that's something that is the observation are doing for all the observations. Now, if we integrate this, we can compute the, the dust optical, optical depth. And you can see again that the, the, the control run is overestimated. Um, when we assimilate the blue, you can see that the lines, which is qualitatively, of course, are close to the, to the error net, aerosol optical depth measurements close to these stations. But when we assimilate LIVAS, which is a brown line, uh, the dust op optical depth is close to the integral of this, this extinction profiles that are almost um, dust uh, optical depth. In, in terms of the scores, um, I, I forget to say here that we have the plume here of the arriving to, to, the, to the Eastern Mediterranean. So we can split basically these profiles in two in, in the profile where we can see the plume, which is more or less here and here, and the profile that we don't have the, the dust that are at the beginning and at the end. So in the profile where we can see the dust are, are green shaded here. Um, we, we also compute the score for each of the profiles. So you can see that compared with the, with the control, the, this, this second row in, in each of the panels is, is the simulation with LIVAS. The error score are much better than uh, the control and, and also are much better than, than the simulation of pure uh, dust optical depth. When we combine both, uh, the, the scores are also good, but not as good as on the levers. But it is, it's, the reduction is, is amazing anyway. Um, I think that, and uh, yeah, I, I, want, I will skip this. It's much more technical. And, and to finish, I want just to remark that we have used uh, the blue dust of the optical depth for first time, and we also assimilate LIVAS for first time. Uh, we show that the simulation is good for the analysis and for the forecast. We show that compared with Aeronet, uh, the simulation of dust uh, optical depth from this blue go, leads, gives better scores, but the simulation of LIVAS is still good. But in comparison with dust uh, extinction coefficients, uh, from ground based LIDAR, the simulation of LIVAS is much better than, than the simulation of this of the blue. We also show that when combined both, it uh, provides a second best, best score for, for either for both of them for the dust uh, optical depth and, and extinction coefficient and could be very good for, for forecast, the operational forecast. Um, finally, we remark that this can be done only. I mean, we can do it because we have Calliope that, that allows an, an algorithm, of course, that allows to, to extract the dust uh, signal from, from, the, from the backscatter signal. So to, to give continuity to this could be, in fact, very useful for, for operational forecast and, and for research of dust. And um, thank you very much uh, for listening. And if you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Escribano. Uh, all the questions will be asked and answered at the, and the, at the end of the session, this session. So thank you very much for sharing with us uh, your results and your experience. Uh, we move on uh, to the next presentation by Dr. Adonis Kikas from the National Observatory of Athens, improving dust and marine modeling through airless wind assimilation. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to participate in this workshop. I hope that you can see my screen in presentation mode, right? Yes, everything is fine, thank you. So my name is Antonis Gikas and I'm coming from the National Observatory of Athens and the talk of my presentation will be about the improvements, the potential improvements on, in aerosol modeling through airless wind assimilation. Here is a structure, the outline of the presentation. We will start with a brief description about the necessity of wind observations in aerosol research. Then we will move with some key information about the ESA Aerosol Satellite Mission. 
and data from EOLO satellite have been used in the Newton and Coral ESA project. In parallel, we are running an exercise for the Etna eruption that took place in March 20, 2020. And finally, it will be a brief description about uh, how we will, how we are about our ongoing work and how we will expand the current activities. So the key word of this presentation is wind, which is a driving force of dust mobilization and production of sea salt, which are subsequently are transported uh, different, uh, in the free troposphere and at low ranges. And it is critical to have the optimum representation of these uh, natural components in numerical simulations in order to have the optimum assessment of their impacts on climate, on radiation, uh, on environment in general, as well as on health, uh, on human health. Here in this animation, which is uh, okay, here's an animation, here's a simulation for the NASA G5 model, it simulates the main uh, tropospheric and stratospheric aerosol species and focusing on dust with orange color and with the sea salt with a blue color, you can see that uh, where are the sources of the arid areas for dust and over oceanic areas in, in, for the sea salt and how these are transported at uh, far distances from the, from the emission areas. Unfortunately, over the main uh, regions of interest, these are the sources and the downwind, as you can see from the network of wind observation, there is a significant and very important and very uh, clear observational gap. This observational gap can be fulfilled by EOLOS, which is operating, operated by the European Space Agency. And it's the first time that we have a UV Doppler wind LIDAR placed in an orbit, in a satellite orbit. This is the Aladdin, which based on the high spectral resolution technique, provides wind profiles up to 30 kilometers along the line of sight. In addition, there are observations for aerosol and cloud optical properties. These are called spin of cold. But today, we will discuss and we will focus only on the wind profiles. And here are two examples of the very light clear curtain profiles. These are the wind vector, the horizontal vector, that is loss wave vector, in areas of the atmosphere where we have only molecules. In the bottom curtain plot, you can see the same profile, but in areas where we have aerosols or clouds. It has been shown, firstly, it has been shown by the ECWF that thanks to the assimilation of failure of these profiles, we have an improvement in numerical weather forecast. And this can be seen at different living times. And these improvements are evident, are pronounced in the southern hemisphere but evident along the top. So the question is that if this information, these improvements can assist the regional models in terms of reproducing the dust and sea salt burdens via the airless data simulation. And this question drives the two, triggers the two ESA projects, Newton and Coral. The first one, Newton, is, has to do with the improvements of dust monitoring and forecasting through airless wind data simulation. And the second project, based on the same concept, deals with the sea salt tires. In this slide, you can see an overview of our methodology. And we start uh, with the IFS outputs de derived by the ECMWF. We have two sets of experiments. The one is called, the first one is called HEL1. And this is the control run without assimilating errors with profiles. And the second one is called HEL4 in which the airless, ray like clear, and mid-cloudy H-loss winds have been assimilated. These data are used in order to initialize two versions of the WRF regional model, the one that it is operating at the National Observatory of Athens, and the second operating in the Cyprus Institute. Here is an example for the wind patterns at 700 hectopascal and for the dust or aerosol optical depth at 550 nanometers, simulated based on the HEL4 experiment. And on the right side, you can see the difference between these two runs, and we can see that there is a response. This concept is exactly the same also for the coral, but for brevity reasons, we will discuss only about it. And finally, the, the third phase of this uh, workflow is, has to do with assessment analysis in order to, to have a robust evaluation and to assess if, thanks to data simulation, we can have better results 
in the original simulation. And for this reason, we are using ground-based data, space bond data, and also reanalysis data sets, which are listed here in the second box. And thanks to these data sets, we have a full information and complete information about the columnar aerosol load, how these loads are structured in, uh, in vertical terms in the atmosphere, as well as which are the spatial patterns. In our case, we focused on May 2020 for both projects, taking advantage of the early COVID-19 campaign that took place in the, where we have simultaneous observations from 20 stations in Europe. And in seven out of 20 stations, we have almost continuous measurements. One of these stations is located at the Panhea Observatory in Southwest Greece in the Dikithira Island. And here you can see the poly noah LIDAR operating there. And based on this LIDAR, on these two curtain plots, you can see uh, the attenuated backscatter coefficient of uh, 532 nanometers and the volume linear depolarization. And you can see throughout May of 2020, and you can see the different aerosol types that have affected the broader area of the station. Based on MERA reanalysis product, Again, for the Pangea Observatory in Southwest Greece, we have uh, reproduced the total aerosol optical depth time series and denoted with a black curve. And also we have calculated the contribution percentages for each aerosol of the five aerosol species simulated by MERA. We have dust, sea salt, black carbon, organic carbon, and sulfate. For the coral, emphasis is given on the first five days of May where we have the contribution of sea salt up to 40%. And for Newton, for the period spanning from 10 May to 20th May of 2020, where dust contributes at least 60% to the total aerosol of the And here on the right side of the slide, you can see some animations for the sea salt and for the dust the aerosol of the And you can see the transport, but also the, the emission uh, in maritime areas for sea salt and how this have affected the central and eastern parts of the Mediterranean. Moving to the assessment results, these are preliminary results, is just a demonstration, and we will see the comparison of the WRF output versus Ironet for three. These are some examples from three stations in Abitithira, Finokaya, and Maya Marina in Cyprus. And with the red circles, we can see the iron aerosol optical depth, while with the black circles, it is uh, presented the angstrom exponent, which serves as an indicator for the existence of, uh, as an indicator of the suspended particle size. And also we have reproduced the two uh, time series of the WRF dust optical depth based on the assimilation experiment and the no assimilation experiment. Unfortunately, we haven't yet finalized or optimized our model configuration. And for this reason, we have large model of estimations and currently we are working on a better definition on the tuning factor. The same analysis, but for the vertical structure of the dust layers has been performed against, uh, again at uh, the Kithra Island. In the upper panel, you can see the two curtain plots of the dust extinction coefficient for the no assimilation and for the assimilation experiments. Here is a difference between these two runs. And always as a reference, we are using the ground-based profiles in these cases from the poly The same finding that we have seen also before for Ironet, we have large overestimations in both the WRF experiments. And if through the subtraction of these two runs, we can see that there are some evident clusters of positive and negative tendencies, which means that there is a variation in the vertical structure of dust layers but we need to, to continue our analysis in order to confirm if we are going to the right direction. And of course, to provide a robust explanation about why these variations are taking place, are happening. The same analysis has been performed also uh, by utilizing Elivas, which has been built based on Calio Calypso profiles. And here we are evaluating again the WRF. This is an example of the Calliope overpass crossing the Eastern Mediterranean. On the upper curtain plot, this is the liver pure dust, pure dust. This is the dust extinction coefficient. And you can see also the corresponding curtain plots 
for the no-assimilation and the assimilation experiment. We have a well reproduction of the dust layers that are structured by WRF. And I, do, I don't want to repeat again the large overestimations that we are finding with the existing model configuration. And in order to complete our assessment analysis, we will use the recently developed MIRAS data set, providing columnar dust optical depth at 550 nanometer on a daily basis and on a fine spatial resolution. And here you can see the global annual and seasonal uh, distributions of dust aerosol optical depth. So with this, we will complement also the variation in, uh, in the two, in 2D spatial terms. Uh, in the framework of Newton, we have the valuable collaboration from our colleagues at the Cyprus Institute. And here is an overview of the activities of the group, of the modeling group at the Cyprus Institute. Actually, they are trying to optimize their model. And here are some results with, uh, for different periods and on different spatial resolutions. And we are planning to, to perform joint experiments in the framework of the Newton project. Actually, uh, also, uh, in addition, I would like to mention one study that currently we are performing at the National Observatory of Athens. And this has to do with the Etna eruption that took place on mid-March of 2020. Here is an animation from the Cerveri satellite where you can see the volcanic plume moving eastwards, crossing the Antikythera Island and continues its trajectory towards Cyprus, also it affects Cyprus, and then it shifts eastward in the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, as well as in Syria. Based on our preliminary simulation runs with a FlexPal WRF model, we can see that we have uh, that the model is able to capture this plume as this has been captured and is, uh, is depicted from the ground-based LIDAR in Adikithira on 12, uh, 12 March. And also, uh, as we have seen before in the, uh, in the animation, this plume continues its travel eastward, affecting the Limassol's uh, uh, ground-based site based on the LIDAR there, operating there. You can see here the, the presence of uh, these particles at this altitude, which are also reproduced by the WRF model. But now we will focus more by using the IFS output as we have seen before for the Newton project on the Coral. In parallel, in the framework of Newton, we are trying to develop our assimilations, uh, to perform our assimilation experiments by developing our assimilation scheme in which the loss wind profiles will be adjusted in the WRF data simulation scheme. And of course, we want to evaluate the performance of the models uh, in terms of reproducing the dust patterns but also meteorological parameters. This is an example of a temperature profile. And for the last slide, which serves as an introduction for the next talk for, from Eleni Drakaki, who has implemented uh, who some de development, critical development of the WRF model by taking into account particles of larger size, sizes than commonly are used in, uh, in state-of-the-art models, and this has been done since there is a strong observational evidence that mineral particles large, with diameters larger than 20 micrometers can travel far away from the sources. Here is an example in the tropical Atlantic Ocean. And to summarize, we have seen the, some basic information in the concept and some preliminary results about the Newton and Coralis projects dealing with dust and sea salt aerosols. Our expectations. Our expectation is to highlight the benefits and the necessity of fireless data and aerosol research, paving the way for future operational satellite missions. And also there are a lot of parallel things that are taking place. One, one is the, uh, the Etna case, the eruption of the Etna volcano. Also, we are trying to develop our assimilation scheme. And finally, we would like to see how much we can improve further the dust modeling capabilities, but in this case, taking into account more realistic and more actual uh, transport size bills. Thank you very much for your attention, but also for the invitation and also for organizing this nice and very interesting work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tigas. Very interesting and enlightening presentation. Thank you indeed.
Uh, it's time to move on to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Lelin Tragagi from the National Observatory of Athens as well. She will talk about optimization of dust transport parameterizations in regional models. The floor is yours. Hello, good evening to everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Of course, everything is perfect. Thank you. Excuse me. Well, uh, um, my name is Elena Drakaki, and I am a PhD student in National Observatory of Sorry Athens. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, yes. Please change the presenter's view. Uh, how I can do that? Display settings. No, I am the upper part of the display okay. settings. Swap presentation okay. slides. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Okay, now you can see the whole presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, my name is Elendra Kaki. I'm a PhD student in National Observatory of Athens. And today I will talk to you about our research on the optimization of dust transport parameterizations on original models. And uh, that uh, research is coordinated by my supervisor, Vasil Samiridis, in the framework of his project on his ERC project. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Well, um, I will try to introduce you in a model paradox that we are facing in the modeling community, community regarding uh, giant dust particles. Uh, and by saying giant dust particles, I mean dust particles greater than uh, uh, 20 micrometers in diameter. Well, those uh, dust particles have been observed in uh, the Caribbean Sea, far away from the resources since the uh, 70s. However, they are not included both in, uh, in the atmospheric dust models and in measurements and retrieval techniques. The reason behind that is mainly that uh, the submicron particles are more important has more important radiate, radiative effect than uh, large particles in a global scale. However, on a, a regional scale, uh, giant dust particles can affect the radiation too. Uh, well, uh, on several studies, uh, comparisons between the model dust particle size distribution and aeronet size distributions, have revealed that uh, uh, models struggle to accurately represent uh, measured dust particle size distribution and mainly underestimate uh, the coarse mode. Uh, uh, that means particles between 5 and 20 micrometers. So on the, on the one hand, we have dust models that uh, uh, underestimate coarse mode of dust particles. And on the other hand, we have dust models that do not include, do not include uh, giant mode, mode dust particles at all. Um, on the last decade, however, um, more and more uh, observational studies have uh, shown that large particles are more ubiquitous in the atmosphere than we thought and that they can travel large distances uh, far away from their sources that uh, the current uh, theory of Stokes gravitational settling cannot uh, explain. Uh, that uh, makes us think that uh, there are one or more uh, physical mechanisms that uh, can explain that behavior and are not well represented in dust models. Uh, on a modeling perspective, uh, we are trying to improve um, dust parameterizations in WRF model that we use, and uh, we have proceeded in several corrections for that reason. Uh, our first correction is to upgrade sphere aerodynamics in WRF model, uh, utilizing an updated drag coefficient proposed by Clift and Govin. Uh, which is valid for, uh, for larger particles. And we have uh, tested uh, the performance of that uh, uh, updated drag coefficient 
for the dust particles uh, with sizes up to 20 micrometers as, uh, in, as they are in the original w, WRF code. And we have seen that uh, the, the updated drug coefficient results in slightly uh, lower velocities for the dust particles and uh, on a slightly uh, increment on dust load in the simulations. Uh, those differences uh, are getting bigger as particle size gets bigger. And uh, there, is an overall, uh, there is an extra benefit from the lower setting velocities of uh, the CFL uh, criterion relaxation. However, the critical point uh, of that is that uh, this drug coefficient is uh, valid for the giant mode of uh, dust particle, particles, and that leads us to our second correction, which is to include giant mode uh, dust particles in WRF mode. And uh, in WRF mode, originally, uh, there are uh, five size bins. The greatest size is 20 micrometers, whereas in our development, we have extended the, that size up to 100 uh, micrometers, redefining that uh, five size bins. Moreover, we have used uh, the uh, particle size distribution of, uh, measured during the Fennec campaign above the Sahara dust sources to uh, distribute the uh, modeled dust, uh, dust emission flux to that uh, seven, uh, to that five size bins. Uh, furthermore, we have uh, to validate our result. We have uh, performed uh, simulations uh, during the period of RD campaign. Uh, in the vicinity of uh, Ca the Canaria Island and uh, Cape Verde in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, our simulations are on a Mesovita uh, scale. We use uh, the measurements from the campaign to validate our models. That measurements uh, are dust particle size distributions and dust profiles. Uh, in addition, we use uh, aeronet uh, measurements uh, of aerosol optical depth and satellite retrievals in order to uh, validate the performance of our simulation. From the results uh, of the comparison, we can see that the model uh, succeeds in uh, capturing most of the dust emission structures and perform an overall uh, good dust spatial distribution. Uh, further, in the comparison with the measurements of particle size distributions, however, we can see here in the right side uh, plot that uh, when we compare the results of our model, both the control run, uh, the original WRF in blue line, and the new run in uh, uh, orange line, we can see that the model fails to reproduce the observed particle size distribution, mainly for the particles uh, uh, with sizes greater than 10 micrometers. Uh, and in some cases, that holds for uh, finer particles. Uh, actually, there is a mechanism that uh, is missing from the model. And we are uh, perform some extra investigation to uh, see what is um, be what is behind that. Uh, to do that, we have performed uh, sensitivity tests, uh, where we uh, reducing the settling velocity of uh, the dust particles by inducing an artificial updraft that is equal to 40, 60, and 80% of the parting setting velocity. Uh, on the plot, uh, you can see uh, with uh, the green, red, and purple line, the results of the particle size distribution for these three sensitivity tests, 40, 60, and 80% respectively. Um, that result starts for the flight B920, 920, uh, of uh, RD campaign, and we can see that the model succeeds the best performance 
for a reduction of 40% uh, of the setting velocity. However, uh, in, uh, in the flight B924 and B928, uh, the best performance is uh, succeed for a reduction between 60 and 80%. Uh, we can see that uh, this um, reduction, the, the optimal re reduction is uh, case sensitive and we, are, in the current state, we investigate uh, the possible reasons that are behind that uh, um, variability. Uh, towards our third correction that is uh, in progress uh, under NOAA, uh, we are um, making uh, more, uh, more, um, more, uh, a better representation of the shape of the particles uh, that is uh, close to reality, closer to reality, assuming uh, dust particles to be uh, to have the shape of uh, prolate ellipsoids. Uh, that assumption is made both in dynamics and radiation. Uh, regarding dynamics, we have developed a new drug coefficient for ellipsoids uh, presented by Malio et al. 2020, uh, where we uh, have found that uh, prolate ellipsoids fall faster than their volume equivalent spheres, but uh, spheres fall, fast, fall faster than prolate ellipsoids with the same size. And uh, we have uh, test uh, in addition, the, the orientation of the particles and the impact on the setting velocities. And we have seen that uh, uh, particle velocities with uh, horizontal orientation, horizontal orientation, fall faster than uh, particles in um, vertical orientation. Uh, uh, also, in uh, radiation, we are uh, assuming uh, ellipsoids by inserting in the model uh, optical parameters uh, calculated for ellipsoid uh, particles. Um, in summary, uh, we have uh, run several improvements under uh, National Observatory of Athens. We are using WRF model and we are using uh, high quality observation to evaluate our uh, experiments. Uh, apart from the airborne, airborne in situ particle size distribution, we use Calypso and ground based LIDARs, MODIS and MSG passive satellite sensors. And uh, at this time, we have uh, included uh, an updated drug coefficient for spheres. We have introduced course mode in WRF, and we are testing um, several uh, assumptions for ellipsoid particles. We are planning to test uh, irregular particles as well, and we uh, uh, test uh, the impact on radiation on all the above uh, considerations. Uh, of course, uh, the results are encouraging and we are planning to uh, validate our results with uh, observations from other campaigns such as A Life and ASCOS campaign that is going to um, uh, take part uh, the next year. And uh, at this time, I would like to thank you for your attention. That was for me. And I will be glad to answer at any question. Thank you very much. I wish to thank uh, Lenny Dragaghi for her presentation. Also interesting. And uh, you must agree with me that during this uh, last session, we had a very good flavor of uh, uh, a number of applications of using remote sensing data and modeling weather and climate. I think uh, we had a very good uh, set of examples. Uh, now I have to switch on to Eleni Lully, who will uh, moderate the discussion, if I understand correctly. Thank, uh, I wish to thank all the speakers on behalf of the organizers and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Michaelis, for chairing this session. Um, we can now uh, take some questions to uh, the speakers. 
Uh, not all of them are with us, but uh, if there are any questions for uh, any speaker who is not uh, online now, we can uh, send it by email or you, we can uh, give you their emails to, to contact them. Uh, but uh, yes, please feel free to use the, I, I guess now we can use the chat or the Q&A, whatever uh, is easier to, to have a discussion. I think everyone is tired. We have a question from uh, Professor Hajimitsis to all the speakers. Uh, how the remote sensing users can be supported to apply an efficient atmospheric correction? I don't know if there is anyone willing to Or maybe we can turn that question around. Um, what does he need from the satellites that are sampling the atmosphere uh, to get his um, uh, efficient atmospheric correction for for the other satellites that uh, view the, the surface? Just to clarify, Eleni, uh, what I mean, I put the question on the chat. Uh, I saw a lot of presentations. I'm coming on the other part for, from a remote sensing user. Uh, there are existing atmospheric correction algorithms that are well-established models or uh, image-based techniques for, uh, for optical uh, remote sensing images like Landsat uh, TM, like uh, Sentinel-2. And uh, one of the uh, most important uh, parameters is to determine the aerosol optical thickness uh, in uh, different areas. Uh, the quick way, if there is an iron station, you can collect them in the nearby area, or there is a, a big uh, gap, especially in the, in the near infrared uh, on the passive remote sensing images to, to measure the water vapor thickness. Is it any way uh, to support this research for developing or using an efficient atmospheric correction algorithms uh, using uh, aerosol optical thickness, using inverse modeling or water vapor thickness determination? Uh, because I saw a lot of uh, a lot of uh, presentations, I mark some of them that probably are more familiar to this question, but this is an open question to all of the speakers. Hello? Raising hands, so yes, maybe there okay, is- Okay, I have raised my hands. I don't know if anybody is going to talk, but then I, I cut the eyes. Um, my name is Raquel de los Reyes. I am uh, in charge of the, actually one of the level, uh, the one software for the level two processors of two hyperspectral missions. And okay, first of all, congratulations for this. Uh, it has been really uh, good uh, insights uh, about aerosols and missions and what is monitor. It's a fantastic work. And actually it would be really interesting to access it because uh, there is very, very detailed AOT measurements, as uh, you, you have pointed out, uh, it's uh, very important, the AOT, 
uh, basically is one of the things. And I'm really interested in Cyprus or regions like this when you have a very high values of the AOT because uh, although there is many Ironet stations all worldwide, I, I guess, fortunately for the human race, the OT is not so high. So it's, uh, especially for example, in, in Europe, you cannot reach uh, something really random or in a special occasions, let's say, very high levels of the OT. So in order to, to adapt the AOT retrieval from, um, I mean, it's not really, 3D is 2D at the end, the image. So in order to optimize these processors, uh, we need uh, a wider range. So well, we need, I would say, I am really interested in the wider range and it's very interesting to have it as soon as possible because also um, of course as frequent as possible because uh, can change from one day to the other. And the sensors of course has an orbit and they pass when they pass, and we have the image at that day. So if uh, some ground stations uh, has good quality, so quality that also can be, I mean, understand. So something that we say, we are really, I mean, you, uh, the, the in-situ measurements are the experts. So they can tell us these are really good. And we can really say, okay, we take this data in order to update and to um, improve our processors also access to the data or as much as, as data as possible, we can access the, the best tool would be. So thank you and congratulations, very nice. Thank you too. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to to address the question of uh, Professor Hajimitsis or have a discussion about this? Maybe I give also a comment to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Dear I guess most of the satellites have already their aerosol correction scheme. And uh, if, even if it's Landsat or Modis or so, I know very well they have them. And that is why Alexandra, for example, showed from Israel showed what is going on if you take MODIS and you have very complex aerosol profile structures. And then you will see that the aerosol model in this MODIS radiative transfer code is failing. So it cannot handle very complex aerosol structures. So uh, I think every satellite uh, mission has the aerosol correction scheme, but then it's difficult to get it right if the aerosol properties are really strange. That is the answer to your question, I guess. And that is why you uh, bought 10 years ago almost a LIDAR to, to see really the structures over Cyprus and to make a much better correction. So I think that is, that is what we should show if we have Excelsior and, and the ECOE. We should really show that you, they are in trouble if they, uh, if they just you, you use their simple model that is uh, over the Mediterranean, I'm sure, that is marine aerosol in the TBL and maybe some dust uh, above. And the dust is pure. They never expect that the dust is full of smoke. That is what we saw about Israel. But maybe I, have, uh, I want to have uh, another comment because I, I'm happy that Johannes uh, brought together so many exciting speakers and that we got a full overview over the uh, over all aspects and we should just uh, tell and keep in mind uh, i tell it to also to the founders that we, we saw the full spectrum we have lidar we have in z2 we have airborne measurements we have uavs we have the modelers in the boat assimilation and in a few weeks a few year, in, in two years we get a big earth care mission so that is so fantastic. And we had a, a meeting where we really could feel like a family today so that we have a, a, the contact to all these persons to make a really big story in two years. And then we can come up again with all the complex aerosol structures to, to, to convince the people that, that we need a system what is con uh, that, that is consisting of orbital sensors and suborbital sensors. And 
and there is modeling in between and we need the full complex instrumentation to, to get a much better view on all the complex uh, situations. That is my message at the moment. And uh, yeah, but to your question, is that almost simple aerosol correction and that's not enough. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Okay. I, I would like to thank also Tropos and all the partners and especially Alper, Johannes and his team for the excellent, for their excellent contribution to this workshop. And I think I will give the pass to Alper to, in the next few days, to prepare a short uh, page with concluding remarks and exchange these remarks with the, all the participants because this is, uh, this was an excellent workshop and we are looking forward to collaborate to all these people in the next uh, few months or years. I'm not sure whether uh, Dr. Mikhailidis uh, would like to, to mention something. Yes. yes, thank you very much, Eleni. I am really more than happy to see that uh, what Alper has just stressed. Uh, I think it was uh, mentioned by all, almost all of the speakers. There should be an interplay between real-time measurements. Okay, what we used to call ground measurements, remote sensing and modeling and through most of the presentations today, we have seen that to tackle problems, the problems that we are facing today, whether these are climate or weather or disaster or disease problems, all these uh, disciplines uh, from the measurements to the remote sensing and modeling, all these have to be put into practice and work together in order to get uh, what we really need, an operational tool that will tackle the problems uh, and provide, you know, yeah. better uh, efficiency and the yeah. better safe work uh, for the human beings. And I'm glad that uh, most of the speakers have really uh, put a lot of effort in presenting this uh, very important aspect. Uh, I, I'm saying this because at some point in, uh, uh, in my career, the real, you know, importance of the ground measurements was put aside. And at some point it was thought that the remote sensing could re, you know, replace everything. Now I see wow. that we are coming back to the earth, <laughs> really, in real terms, and uh, seeing that the observations have to be matched with uh, remote sensing from space, from radar, from all kinds of instruments these days. And you know, all of these can be fed into models and work together to get a better product. This is what I really wanted to say. Thank you very much. I would also, I would, so to Silas, I would like to, uh, to add, that is my experience with the, with the weather services. We have to, we have to try to bring, to, to, to keep the services in the boat. Usually we are a scientific community and we play around with all our instruments and models. And then, yeah, so, but, but the agency have often the money and can at least, uh, trigger a third party funding. So uh, when I saw this, uh, this guy from the Meteorological Service of Cyprus, yes, yes. we should show them what we can have if we have a LIDAR for dust forecasts. That is it. So we have the vertical uh, information. One show, if we look at the map with the dust, we see the trotter's mouth. That means uh, the, the dust is lower than 2000 meters. So you can already, ex so we, we could show the, the weather service so many things. And so that is one message. We cannot only stick together with the scientists. We need to go the way to the yes. service. environmental service and weather service. I, I fully agree, Albert. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, to everyone also for this uh, discussion. Um, I guess there are no further questions or comments. And at this point, I would also like to thank all the speakers for their presentations and also all the attendees for uh, being with us the whole day. I, we know that uh, virtual events are not as fun as they were last year, 
in the start of the pandemic, but we really appreciate uh, your presence here. And um, at this point, uh, I would also like to take the chance to announce the upcoming event we plan for next uh, Tuesday. Uh, just give me a second to, to share the invitation. Um, okay, a slightly different topic. Next week, we will be uh, hosting a webinar on uh, water resources management, shorter this, uh, this time with four speakers. And uh, you will be informed also through our social media. And uh, if you subscribe to, the, to our emails, you will be informed also via email. And uh, I will also uh, share the registration link in the chat um, for your information. Um, okay, uh, just sharing the, the link now. Uh, thanks again to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eleni. Thank you, Tomai. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much.